Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Torres and I welcome you to this week's very special edition of the Backline Report. Every week, my co-host Fred Alvader and I get together and check in on the world of golf to bring you the latest news, insights, analysis, interviews, recaps, previews. Hey, we cover anything and everything golf. In other words, if it happened in golf, we have it for you. But I mentioned this is a very special edition. It's the edition for the 102nd PGA Championship. So this is a major. Finally, we get a major this year in golf, in men's golf, and we're going to have to bring the expert advice and commentary from Kieran Clark directly from Scotland. So as usual, we'll bring him up first. Kieran, welcome again, welcome again to the show. How are you today? Well, thank you, Carlos. And uh, you're right. It, it, it's fun to have a major back. Um, if you'd asked anybody, you know, back last July, 13 months ago, when Shane Lowry won the Open Championship in such fantastic fashion at Royal Portrush, that that would be the last major championship until August 2020. No one would believe you, and they would believe you even less if you said that first major of the year would actually be the PGA Championship. So these are extraordinary times, um, unique, uh, obviously the most unique golf season any of us will hopefully ever see uh, in future, but uh, there's a sense of normality in having a major this week, obviously different format obviously no fans being there won't quite have the same atmosphere and gravitas to it but nonetheless it's nice to have a sense of normality and major golf coming back and obviously spending time with you two this evening talking about the PGA Championship that is also a sense of normality so I'm very grateful for that. Fred hi how are you this week? Hey uh, you know I think there's a quote from the Bible it says something like uh, yay I say to those that have been last they shall be first. Well, the PGA Championship for years and years and years was the last major championship every year. And we had to wait from then clear around to April for the next Masters. Well, this year, it was supposed to be the second. It was supposed to be in May. But now it's the first one of the year. So it's jumped all the way from last to first. Uh, but we finally got a major. We finally got some, some real-time, big-time golf going on. And uh, can't wait to that. It's just been such an upside down, topsy turvy year. We're very happy that Kieran is able to be here to talk about the PGA Championship tonight. So, hey, this week in golf, guys, Rom is out as number one. His term was very short lived. JT is back in the number one spot. Iverness is a beast. We can uh, we can confirm that now. I kept telling you guys that. And we finally have a major championship and a Tiger sighting this week in San Francisco. A lot of golf to talk about tonight, so let's get to it, guys. Let's go. Yeah, Carlos, I, mean, I must quickly say there, can I quickly interject? I must say, what a show this is. We're having quotes from the Bible. I mean, that's just incredible. That's that's... Amen. Amen, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Astonishing stuff. That, that's, that is the kind of quality insight and analysis that you get on the Back Nine Report. <laughs> Never doubted that we go all the way. We cover everything. It's not everything and anything golf. It's everything and anything that exists. That is what the Back Nine Report does. But it, and we're good at it. So, um, you know, it's starting to become some sense of normality. I mean, all the major tours were back last week, our show last week was full of uh, news and talking about it, almost everything else. And now we see we're going to have a major this week. And we had a WGC. It's, it's like back-to-back -back heaven for us, right? And the WGC this past week, and you mentioned about uh, JT going back to number one, there's a reason for that. I mean, he has picked up his third, third win of the season with that victory at the WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational at the PC South win in Memphis, Tennessee. He won by three shots on 13 under. He closed with a 65 on Sunday to take the title. Brooks Kepka, who finally showed up, uh, was a stroke behind heading into that final hole. Oh man, but he made that double bogey on the 18 to fall into a tie for second place with the charging Tom Lewis and Phil Mickelson. He looked renewed there. Uh, six players tied for six place and nine under total. So JT won the $1.82 million winner's share of the $10.5 million purse. This week, there was no cut as it's standard with the Stroke Play World, uh, World Golf Championship events. So Kieran, 
JT earned 76 official World Golf Ranking points with the win. That was enough to get him back into the top spot in the official World Golf Rankings, overtaking John Ram, or like Fred said, that number one was short-lived. But hey, nothing to be ashamed of. JT is playing really, really well and really deserves to be that number one right now. Well, certainly. And um, you know, obviously, John Ram's term as number one at the moment was obviously very short. Although he did, of course, beat the, the record, which is Tom Lehman's one week that he had back in the day. One week of the year, he was world number one. One, one week in his career, he was number one. So Ram is uh, one week ahead of Lehman. So that's something to be proud of. But uh, yeah, jo Justin Thomas, I mean, fantastic victory for him. Uh, you know, as you say, 13th victory in the PGA Tour, second WGC, back to number one with, of course, Jim Bones Mackay on the bag and what a fascinating dynamic that was obviously playing with Phil Mickelson in that final group uh, there's a degree of awkwardness to that I guess I'm not sure if it's like um, coming across a, an ex-girlfriend with her new boyfriend maybe or not I'm not too sure but there's a degree of uh, you know a little bit of social distancing obviously naturally because of the circumstances but a little bit of social awkwardness on top of it too so but that said, it did not stop either of them from playing very well. And uh, Thomas was obviously superb. A little bit wayward off the tee towards the end. Um, a couple of lucky breaks there, but he made the most of those, scrambled extremely well, and obviously held on to win the event. And, you know, I always think with Justin Thomas, and I think we've said this for quite a few years now, that he's one of those guys, when he gets into a position on a Sunday, he looks more likely than most to win. He has that ability to grind it out. He's some guys, you know, they, they're obviously superb players. They play extremely well. But on a Sunday, perhaps the best example would be Tony Fina, who gets into great positions all the time, but just doesn't quite have that edge, you know, to get over the line. Whereas Justin Thomas has a rate that's far better than most. Um, and he's someone who I think is, you know, proven so far to be a serial winner. And I think he certainly will be going forward. So he is obviously, you know, he launched into the, the favourite position at the PGA Championship. So he, he was fantastic. And um, so, yeah, I mean, Thomas, as I say, former winner of the PGA Championship three years ago, of course, coming back in this week as world number one off the back of this victory. His confidence will be sky high. Uh, but he's one of those guys who, when he's on the back nine on a Sunday, he's someone who you know more likely than not will not fold. And even when he does or has a a bad loss, as he did at Muirfield Village when he lost to Colin Morikawa there in the playoff. You know, a great finish that week. But Thomas, that, that stung him a little bit. And I think the finish there we saw at TPC Southwind was his answer to that, his repost, his saying that I'm not going to be in that situation once again. So he ensured he was not going to be a, in a playoff position, obviously, and losing another event. Um, but of course, there was a great pack behind him who will obviously delve into Carlos shortly. But, um, but yeah, it was a fascinating leaderboard there. We came out of that WGC with uh, several storylines coming into this week at the PGA Championship. So it was obviously, you know, obviously Kepka, you're showing great form, Phil rolling back the years too. So there's a lot going on there and it really does set the stage for uh, this week's major. Fred, your take on JT's win this week. Well, yeah, just a couple points uh, real quick. Uh, I'm going to save my time for later. But, uh, uh, you know, you just rolled that 1.8 million winner's check right off your tongue, just like it's no big deal. $1.8 million, that's a lot of money, guys. And, you know, we're paying these big purses. These guys are winning us big money. It's, it's, it's really, really amazing. But we've kind of become used to that, accustomed to it. And, but it's still a lot of money. Um, you make a really good point, Kieran, about uh, Justin Thomas with Sunday leads versus a guy like Tony Finau, who kind of lets it get to him, the pressure get to him, and doesn't quite get it done. Uh, that, that, that's a really good point. Um, and then also, Justin, I think that did sting a little bit, losing to Colin Arkawa at Muirfield Village. Uh, and, and I think this was a good answer. This was a really good bounce back for him. And I'll tell you what, he, it's going to be tough to beat him, I think, in San Francisco this week. We'll talk about that more later. And, yes, uh, I don't think it was really uncomfortable for Bones and Phil to be in the same group. I think they probably had a blast with it, actually. They're such good friends. They've been together for so long. But how about Bones, you know, holding Matt Fitzpatrick's hand around Memorial, around Muirfield Village, and having a good finish there? 
then coming over and working with JT and getting a win. I'll tell you guys, if you got a good caddy, I'll tell you that's worth, you know, maybe a couple shots a day or one shot a day. And over four rounds, that's the difference of winning or losing or finishing top 10. Uh, that just shows you how good Bones is better than everybody else, guys. Uh, Karen, how about the rest of the field? Any comments uh, on anybody else that you, that, you know, jumped out uh, on display? Well, very much so. And I think the, the guy, all the guys who finished second all had different stories and different takeaways from the week. You know, for Daniel Berger, it's really just continuation of what's been a fantastic return uh, to the PGA Tour since the game resumed, obviously. He's a guy who obviously came on the tour several years ago, won quite early, then completely fell away. Uh, but this year, he's been fantastic, obviously winning at Colonial. He was third at Hilton Head, uh, been very consistent since the return, and is playing some very good golf and perhaps shows that his uh, early promise will now finally be fulfilled as we go into, obviously, a very busy end of season with the majors and the FedEx Cup and so on. And also Tom Lewis. I mean, that was an unbelievable weekend he had. I mean, shooting 61 on Saturday, then the 66 on the Sunday. But if you break it down even further, Carlos, um, he played three nines at TPC Southwind in 30, 31, and then 30. Um, so extraordinary 27 holes he played. Uh, he struggled a little bit on the back nine on Sunday, shot 36 on the back nine, one over par, which kind of let him down a little bit. Uh, but a, a great week for him, probably the best week of his career, certainly financially. Uh, he was a low amateur at the Open Championship way back in 2011, and uh, he was a really promising player. He won on the European Tour very early uh, when he was 20 in Portugal, uh, but he, he completely fell off the planet in terms of his golf. He disappeared largely, but then emerged a couple of years ago again, and he won again in Portugal for a second time. Uh, and then, of course, he went over to the US last year. He won the Corn Ferry Tour Championship there, getting his PGA Tour card. So he, with this performance here at the WGC, obviously a huge field, you know, very impressive, sets him up for the weeks ahead. Uh, perhaps you know, his early promise that he showed almost a decade ago will actually be fulfilled. He's still only 29 years old, uh, a, a lot of years left for him, surely. And uh, you know, maybe Tom Lewis will actually be one of those, the, the next really top English player to actually make an impact in America in the coming months and years. Uh, but in terms of guys who rolled back the years, Carlos, obviously Phil Mickelson, you know, very solid performance from him. You know, bogey free on Sunday, uh, very solid all round. You know, showed that there's still some class in his game uh, at 50 years of age. Um, and he's now back in the world's top 50 again. You know, obviously he had the, the extraordinary record of being in there for 26 years, then fell out obviously this year. Now he's back. Uh, I'm not going to say Phil's going to go and win some majors again, but he still showed that there's enough there to be competitive on certain weeks, and I think on certain golf courses, that he can still be a threat to the top players. But I think in terms of the guys who finished second and also in the pack, the biggest story obviously was Brooks Kepka, particularly ahead of this week. Uh, he has not looked himself really since he actually won this of well, the WGC last year. Uh, he hadn't done very much at all and particularly struggled since the tour came back, you know, niggling knee problem there, not looking sharp with his game, not having that spark. Maybe it's a lack of crowds, I'm not too sure, but he's, he had a little bit of work with Pete Cowan, the short game coach, and he looked right back to form. Obviously could have won the event, had a bit of a messy finish there in the last two or three holes, uh, but he obviously knows that the majors are coming back because that's when Kepka, you know, raises his game and, uh, you know, that's 62 on Thursday. That was a statement of saying, you know, I'm back. And uh, as we go into this week, which we'll come to later on in the show, obviously searching for that free peak, that treble of PGA victories, you know, Kepka suddenly, you know, catapulted himself right back into that conversation as being a likely contender at TPC Harding Park. So it's, uh, I, I said earlier, you know, I think coming out of this WGC, we're left with a, a lot of fascinating stories setting us up for this week at the PGA. Fred, any, anything else you want to add uh, regarding the, the tournament? Yeah, just two real quick comments, uh, Carlos. Um, uh, no bogeys for Phil. That, how often can we say that, right? Phil's usually a roller coaster, up and down, a bogey here, a double there, a birdie, an eagle. You know, uh, he's usually throwing in a little bit of everything. So. That's unusual for him to have that kind of a round. 
And, and your point about uh, Brooks, uh, I think he was the big winner coming out of this thing. Um, this gave him a lot of confidence. And even though he struggled in the run round, he, he played really well and, and gave, really gave him a lot of confidence going into the PGA this week. Um, and the thing we didn't mention was that Justin Thomas, with those 13 wins, uh, joins a pretty elite group. Only two other guys have had 13 wins before the 30th birthday, and that those two guys were named Jack and Tiger. So that's a pretty good group to be in. Yeah, that's why that was going to be my closing talk, uh, comment. Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. you stole that from him, Fred. I, oh, I should have said it before. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's just 27 years old and now has 13 PGA Tour victories, which becomes the third youngest man to win 13 PGA Tour titles since 1960 after very good company, like you mentioned, Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus. And it's also his second WGC victory after winning the same trophy at the WGC Bridgestone Invitational two years ago. So now, like I mentioned at the beginning, he has three wins in this season. He won the CJ Cup and the Tournament of Champions. Definitely the top player so far this year. Now let's move on to another tournament, the Barracuda Championship, where Richie Wierenski picked up his first PGA Tour win with a one-point victory at the Tahoe Mount Club's Old Greenwood Course in Truckee, California. I like that name, Truckee. <laughs> Richie won the tournament by a point over Troy Merritt, uh, and the PGA Tour's only event played under the modified stable forward scoring system. He had 39 points to Merritt's 38, and he made an eagle two par 416, holding a pitch shot. It was about 50 yards to score five points. With a birdie on the closing hole, scoring another two points, then Wierenski took the lead from Merritt, who could not birdie the last that he needed to win. Fabian Gomez and Matias Schwab finished tied for third place with 37 points each. Uh, Wierenski now won $640,000 for the winner's chair of the $3.5 million purse. And Fred Wierenski and Mary also earned spot now in the 2020 U.S. Open through the allocation of the two spots of the top finishers, not already exempt into the second major of the calendar. So good thing for them. And Richie Wierenski was just close at the 3M also. So it finally seems like he's playing well and Maybe, who knows, you know, he might be uh, looking up now. Yeah, he's one of those guys whose name would pop up maybe one week or two weeks a year that would, would end up with a high finish and kind of keep his card and, and stay on tour. But he's never been a really consistent player. So he's obviously very good to qualify for the PGA Tour and be up with those guys. So maybe we'll st start to see more of him. Uh, just a couple points. I, I really tried to watch a little bit of this over the weekend. And I was watching, I think, on Sunday when uh, Merritt was leading and he had a second shot at a par five uh, and it was, it was a carry across water, but there was plenty of room on the other side. And he just nails a, like a five wood or something. And he only had like 230 uh, to the front of the green. He only had to carry the water maybe 200 or something. And he just nails this five wood and the water and the wind comes up and knocks it into the water. Uh, and I'm thinking, what kind of a golf course is this when you've got pros that they're only 230 out, they only got to carry the water to 200, and the wind knocks it down. I, I, I lost interest and I shut it off, to be quite honest with you. Didn't like the golf course. Um, the only other thing I found interesting coming out of the Barracuda was that Brandon Grace was in second place when he was tested positive, uh, kind of mid-tournament. Uh, so he had to go self-quarantine. So he didn't get anything out of it. Now he's not in the PGA because he has to be quarantined. So Brandon Gray, has got, it cost him a lot of money uh, to be tested positive at the Barracuda. Unfortunately, there for him. Uh, Kieran, what's your take on uh, Richie Wierenski's win here? The yes, it's a very tough break for, for Brandon Grace, obviously testing positive for COVID-19. Obviously, as Fred touched on, he'll be missing the PGA this week. But Richie Wierenski will be in the PGA this week and he'll be teeing off on Thursday at 12.35 p.m. local time. So obviously coming off his finish at the 3M Open there we finished Ty third, winning this week here at the Barracuda. I'm not saying he's going to go and win the PGA Championship, but he'll be confident of going into that major and potentially having a decent finish and uh, trying to you know, obviously take on the 
you know, getting a win on tour obviously is great job security. It gives you that foundation to go on and fulfill your potential. Um, I think you know establishing yourself on tour is the hardest thing for any player to do, and only when they do that can they then actually show how good they can be. So he's one of those guys who might now actually become a more consistent contender and potentially a more consistent winner because we've seen that happen so many times before where guys that you might not have heard of, suddenly they win and then they go on. Look at Brendan Todd, for example, who has come from nowhere in the past year or so to become one of the top players in the tour in terms of his form. So uh, you know, who knows, maybe Richie Wawrenski can be the next guy on that list to actually, you know, once he's now established, to really now show uh, what he's capable of. And who knows, he might even have a decent week in San Francisco. All right. So with that, now we're going to move to a tournament that I, I don't know how to name. To me, it's the English Open. They call it the Hero Open. I don't know. I, I'll say it's the, the English Open. I, I, I don't know. If you want to correct me, Kieran, you're, you're the authority here. No, not at all. Not at all. all right. English Open all the way. All right. Well, I, I did it well then last week. I feel better. <laughs> All right, so Sam Horsfield pick up his first European Tour win with a one-stroke victory there at the Marriott Forest of Arden Golf and Country Club in Birmingham, England. He won the tournament on 18 under. He made a crucial two-putt par on the closing par three to secure a final round of four under. Thomas Dietrich missed a close par putt there on that final howl that would have ultimately forced a playoff, leading him to a second-place finish. Alex Bjork, Chris Paisley, and Oliver Farr finish in a tie for third place at 14 under, four back of Horsfield. Now, Horsfield won 156,825 euros. Uh, that's the winner's share of the $1 million, 1 million euros purse. <laughs> it's not dollars. Anyway, Horsfield earned 24 uh, official world golf rank, ranking points with that win. The field for this five... Uh, for the first of five tournaments in the UK swing wasn't particularly strong, but it will help him with his ranking a little bit. So Kieran, the, this week the cut was made at two under, 71 players getting through to the weekend. So how about the swing by Sam Horsfield? Well, it's a, it's a long time coming. Um, Sam Horsfield is one of those guys who we've heard an awful lot about several years ago. Yeah, a fantastic amateur record, a very highly regarded at college as well. He was born in England, but he's lived in America since he was five years of age. Um, he's grown up there. And much was expected of him uh, from a very early age. So Ian Poulter was among those who predicted very big things uh, for Sam. And when you see the likes of you know, Victor Hovland and Colin Morikawa and Matt Wolfe achieve you know, great things very quickly when turning professional, um, Sam didn't quite have that uh, transition that they did. And it's taken Sam a little bit longer to break through, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think the ultimate example of that is uh, Brooks Kepka, who had a very uh, kind of undistinguished beginning in, in the professional game, obviously emerged in Europe and worked his way up through the ranks and is obviously now you know, a superstar, four-time major winner. So Sam will be hoping for obviously something similar to that, but it's, it just shows you there are, there are different pathways to get to the top. And uh, for Sam, this is going to be the, the first step in that journey to become a serial winner uh, on the professional circuit. Um, so a, a huge moment for him at the Forest of Arden, which is an iconic venue from years past on the European Tour, obviously now emerged as part of this new UK swing schedule that they've had. Um, but you know, a lovely resort, you know, very popular place for people to go to, and it looked great on TV. And Sam, the great finish there, had a fantastic shot on the 17th par five to set up a birdie that proved to be defining as you said there, Carlos, he made that par in the last on the par three to secure the title. Much disappointment for Thomas Dietrich, uh, the young Belgian who had done everything right and got himself in that position to win and then missed that short putt for par on the last. And that proved to be defining for him, obviously missing out on the playoff chance by, by one shot. So a little bit heartbreaking there for him, uh, losing by one shot, but obviously a great moment for Sam Horsfield. And obviously, you mentioned there, Carlos, the likes of Alexander Bjork, Oliver Farr, Chris Paisley, who obviously played very well, finishing in, uh, a little bit further back in the field. So, yeah, the, the field itself is obviously not going to be star-studded and full of great names. But for these guys, it's a great opportunity to play. And, you know, win's a win for anybody. And for Sam Horsfield, he'll take so much confidence from this. Uh, he was, you know, very emotional afterwards. He was, you know, speaking to his family. 
uh, via the internet at the end and uh, you can see what it meant to them, what it meant to him. Uh, it's been a long journey for him to get here um, and now he's got the foundation to potentially secure more titles later this summer. The UK swing continues this week with the English Championship at Hanbury Manor. So, you know, Sam Horsfield you know, may now show and actually fulfil that early promise and fulfil that hype that so many people you know, put around him. But of course, as we all know, you know, being a great amateur, being a great college player doesn't necessarily translate into the professional game. Uh, but when it does, he's used to being successful. And I, I could see him now becoming a more consistent contender on the European tour. And of course, that will eventually, all going well, lead to him making more appearances in the States. Uh, but elsewhere, Carlos, just quickly before, I, I was going to mention Miguel Angel Jimenez, but we'll talk about him. We'll give him his own platform later on as part of the Par 5 News. He deserves that status. But one other name from yesteryear who I spotted on the leaderboard, which surprised me, was Michael Campbell, former US Open champion, who made the cut at the Forest of Arden. He's 51 now, and he had not made a cut anywhere in golf since 2013. Um, he more or less walked away from the game, really struggled with his golf for a long time. Now he's kind of come back slowly, and to actually make the cut in a European Tour event for him was a huge achievement for him. Um, and the thing was, with Michael Campbell, obviously he won the US Open at Pinehurst years ago, and you know, what was a, a shock victory, but he was always a very mercurial player. When he was on, he was very, very good. He almost won the Open at St Andrews 25 years ago. And actually, I have, a, I have a little soft spot for Michael Campbell because way back in the day, in the Scottish Open at Loch Lomond, when I was just a wee lad, when I was there watching as a fan, inside, outside the ropes, uh, at, um, when I was 12 years old, Michael Campbell gave me his golf ball which I still have in a drawer somewhere. So I, I always look out for Michael Campbell. So I was very pleased to see him make the cut and roll back the years and enjoy a little bit of success there. Um, but yeah, obviously the main story from the week was Sam Horsfield, who got his first win on tour. And I think it will be the first of many. Carlos. How about this win by Sam Horsfield, Fred? Yeah, I, I don't, I really didn't pay much attention to the, to the European Tour event. I just have one question. Did I see someone getting in a rowboat to go over to an island to hit a golf ball? Did I see that somewhere? Oh, yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> well, that was Joel Schulholm, the very colorful Swede who hit a, hit a second shot on the 17th, a par five over water, trying to get there in two. Obviously, it was not the best shot, and it landed on this very small man-made island in the middle of the water. Um, and... Obviously, very fortunate to miss the water entirely. But, of course, he wanted to save himself, obviously, having a penalty shot. So he got on a little rowboat or a little pool boat and reeled himself across the other side with his clubs in hand, moved some advertising boards, then played a shot onto the green, made bogey in the end, but still it could have been worse. Um, how long did, how long did it take scenes. him to do all this? I mean, how Well, it was, it was a remarkable scene. I mean, I watched it live on TV. And if anyone... Joel Schulholm is, is a... Very popular character. He's um, a little bit wacky in places. Um, he's a very unusual dress sense. So really, it's a case of if it was going to happen to anybody, it would be him in this particular case. But way back in the day, I think back in the 1990s, this actually happened before at the Forest of Arden in a previous European Tour event. Um, the name of the player escapes me, but it has happened before. But obviously, very surreal. And you know, when I was watching that, watching a professional golfer in a little boat going across, playing a shot, then going back. I thought, you can't tell me that golf is not the greatest game in the world. I mean, that's just amazing. Isn't it? I mean, what other sport could that happen in? I just got to chuckle out of that way. I had to make sure we got that on the show tonight, guys. I, I, yeah. thought, that was, I thought that was great. All right. Now let's move on to the LPGA where Daniel Kang pick up her fourth career LPGA win. With a one shot at victory at the Inverness Club in Toledo, Ohio, Fred. Hey, Daniel won the 54 whole event by a stroke over Salim Boutier on 7 under. Minjay Lee, Minji Lee uh, finished alone in uh, third at 4 under, while Jui Kawamoto and Jody Iwar Shada finish out the top five. Daniel Kane won $150,000, the winner's share of the $1 million purse, and now picks up the win in the first LPGA Tour event back since more than four months out of competition. 
And by the way, she was playing really, really well. Maybe she was maybe the hottest player going into the lockdown. And this event that was created with the help from sponsors of cancel events, who diverted some prize money to create the tournament, as well as Inverness Club, Club who hosts the Solheim Cup next year. So at least we see some LPGA um, action finally this week. The cut was made at six overs of 78 players, got through to the final round. Fred Inverness showed its teeth, but it was Daniel Kang at the end who, who we mentioned, like I said, it was the hotter player, went into the lockdown and came out of it just like that. Yeah, a couple things. Um, really kudos to the members at Inverness who opened up their doors to let the LPGA come in and do this. Uh, first of all, the old uh, administration of Inverness, uh, you know, over the years before would not have done this. I I'm telling you, they would not have done this. If it wasn't the U.S. Open, uh, they don't want anything to do with it. And so with the Solheim Cup coming there next year, and to let the, the LPGA put together a really quick tournament and come in there and play for, for three days, uh, shut it down to the membership. That was, that was really big, and, and kudos to them for doing that. Second of all, um, Celine Boudier played really well all week. Just you know, a little shot here, a little shot there made the difference. And in the end, she hit a better second shot on the 54th hole, that famous 18th where Bob Tway chipped in to beat Greg Norman uh, and Paul Eager beat Paul, uh, Greg Norman a few years later. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an iconic hole. And Boudier nipped a great like 70 yard uh, chip shot in there. I mean, it almost jumped in the hole after it hit the green. It just was so close. Still was in five feet uh, when, uh, when uh, Daniel Kang knocked hers to about 25 feet. And she nearly made the putt, a double breaker coming back down the hill. It's a really tough putt um, and, uh, and tapped into her par. And you saw, thought, sure, Boudier was going to make that putt to go to uh, extra halls. But she just, she really gagged it. She, it just, it, the moment was too big for her, and she really jerked that putt dead left. Uh, unfortunate, but uh, she played really well. But I, got it. I can't say enough for Daniel Kang, because I'm telling you what, Inverness was tough. It was wet. On Saturday, it rained all day. And, and parts of the time, it rained fairly hard. It, it came down. It, there was no lightning, so they continued to play. Uh, it, was, it was really good stuff. But, you know, this proves Daniel Kang, you know, she won a, a U.S. Women's Open, right? This was a U.S. Women's Open type golf course. It, it was really tough. The, the rough is, is deep. Um, it, it, the fairways are tight. And uh, the greens have enough break on them. They're not severe, but there's enough break. It's a lot of subtle break in, in there. It's a really, really tough golf course. Andrew Green did a phenomenal job on the renovation. I hope you guys got a chance to look at it because I'm telling you, Inverness is a, is a fantastic place. It's one of the best golf courses I have ever been to. And uh, just uh, it wowed the players, it wowed the fans, it wowed the TV crew. They all couldn't say enough about it. And, uh, and it, it, it was really a good tournament, one that they threw together rather quickly. And uh, kudos to the LPGA and Inverness and everybody involved for getting that thing done. Aaron, how about the win by Daniel Kang? Well, a fantastic win, and I think Fred, you know, explained it very well in terms of the venue, what it means. You know, Inverness is obviously a, a course of a great stature and great history. So it was fascinating for me to see it actually on TV uh, live uh, for the first time, I think, and uh, it looked fantastic. It was a major championship standard test. Um, so therefore, it was appropriate, I guess, that a major champion won the event, and uh, Daniel Kang certainly played like one. I mean, that's a fantastic score. Seven under round there over the three rounds. You know, given how difficult the course plays naturally, but also, as Fred touched on, some of the conditions they had there too were challenging and just added uh, to the difficulty of that golf course. So it was a real, a great uh, showcase for the LPGA Tour, I think, and um, you know, a great leaderboard, obviously, exciting finish on a great golf course. I mean, that's all you can ask for. Uh, but Daniel Kang, I mean, she's, you know, has a great, you know, one that obviously won the, the Women's PGA Championship three years ago, has been a Solheim Cup player, but has now in the past couple of years become more consistent as a winner, has won every season over the past three years. Uh, and she kept her game you know, very sharp uh, during the, the lockdown period uh, while in Las Vegas. Uh, that's where her coach, Butch Harmon, uh, lives. So she was able to get 
some tuition from him. And she also played regularly with her brother and her boyfriend, who of course is Maverick McNeely, the, the PGA Tour player. So a lot of that, a lot, a lot of golf there, keeping competitive, keeping sharp, keeping fresh. And that certainly, you know, was proven with how she played when she came back, obviously in Ohio there. So a fantastic victory for her. And uh, it shows that I think her best years are going to be ahead. And you know, the rest of this season, you know, it's going to be a very exciting time for her. Can she capitalise on this? Can she secure more victories? Can she you know, get towards the summit of the world rankings? So there's an awful lot to play for for Daniel Kang. Uh, but yeah, fantastic event, you know, great venue. I look forward to the Solheim Cup next year. Uh, that golf course is tremendous. And I think it's going to be a great stage for obviously the, the players next year when Europe defend the Solheim Cup against the US. So there's a, a lot to look forward to, but it was a great return to the LPJ, obviously after so long, you know, obviously a bit of degree of anxiety about putting the event together. A lot, a lot of work's got into it, as Fred explained, uh, but I think they couldn't have asked for a better result. It was a, it was a, great, a great event and a, a great way to reintroduce us to the LPJ Tour, Carlos. And Daniel, pick up where, right where she left. Uh, she's playing great, and I think this is going to be a confidence builder going out. So she's just uh, she took a delight, the leg up on the rest of the competition moving forward. Now, watch out, Champions Tour. Oh, watch out, because Jim Furyk won his tour debut at Warwick Hills Golf Club and Country Club in Grand Blanc, Michigan. He won the 54-hole event by two shots over Retief Guzin and Brett Quickly. He had to overcome Quickly's 36-hole uh, lead in winning on 14-under after closing with a 68. Now, Chris DeMarco, Rod Pampling, and West Church Jr. finished in the tie for fourth place, a stroke behind the pair sharing second place. So for Furyk, now he won $300,000, which is the winner's share of the $2 million purse and becomes the 19th golfer in the history of the PGA Tour champions to win in his debut tournament. Kieran, he's the first to do so since Miguel Angel Jimenez, who we're going to more, uh, who won the 2014 Greater Gwinnett Championship. And on a side note, on a side note, I have to mention this because last week I mentioned it. I mean, I'm all inspired. I, I, I mean, this week I started, you know, dieting and all this stuff, you know, and I had to talk to you. I wanted to. Well, you look a lot better. I can tell it already. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I'm, I'm starting on it. So, Monty, Colin Montgomery, that weight loss, I mean, it's remarkable. And he finished T4 at 34, so it didn't help him so much this week. But I wanted to ask you, other than your thoughts on Jim Furyk, the win, what do you think about Monty's dramatic weight loss and his performance moving forward? I, I, I got a little bird who told me that now he's even thinner than you. Is that right? I mean, how's that happening? Oh, Carlos, you're very naughty for bringing that up. That's a bit harsh on me, I have to say. But, um, but yeah, I have to say, you mentioned yourself there, Carlos, that you are you know, changing your lifestyle, going on a little bit of a health kick. Uh, I am doing the same. Uh, we're doing this together, me and you, Carlos. We've been inspired by Monty's example. To be honest with you, and I said this before the show, I can't live in a world where Colin Montgomery is slimmer than I am. I'm afraid that was a tipping point. Um, it's <laughs> too far. I've, I've been living in denial for too long, but that was the thing where I felt, you know what? If he can do it, I can do it. Although I have to say... I thought you were trying to bulk up and uh, reach out like Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, well, you know... I, to be, to be fair, I have to say that Bryson's diet, I mean, uh, I don't want to go to the bathroom that often. I think he'll be in the bathroom too often, drinking all those protein shakes. You know, I prefer to avoid that when I can. Um, so, but yeah, Colin Montgomery, you know, all credit to him, as he would say himself. Um, you know, he, he lost 40 pounds in weight over the lockdown period. He's as if he stepped out of a fat suit. It's quite impressive. Although that said, between you and me, I do prefer my Monty fat. I think he looks better fat. It doesn't look right, does he? You expect Monty to have a little bit of bulk to kind of not quite fit in his shirt. You know, he looks he looks too much like an athlete now. Um, so we'll see how it plays out. But no, for his health that's and never, well-being. That's, he's never going to look too much like an athlete. Well, though. I guess not, but relatively <laughs> speaking. <laughs> but um, yeah, to be fair, he wasn't looking very healthy before the lockdown. So I think it is for the best and, uh, you know, Credit to him for that. But uh, yeah, I think in a, in a few weeks time, you know, Fred, you may laugh at us here, but you know, Carlos and myself, we will be rejuvenated 
by the end of this year. And you mentioned weight loss. I mean, I, I have lost some weight over the past week. It's a little bit below the man breasts and above the belly. I've lost a bit of weight here. I don't know what you call this bit, but I have, I can assure you. We'll call it the outer diaphragm, I guess. Um, so I certainly lost... not abs. <laughs> well, there never will be. The day I walk into a gym is the day you can shoot me. Something's gone wrong. I mean, I've, I've snapped. It's never going to happen. It's but, not um, a back to the... back. It's a full case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, back back to the golf. By the way, I think we've probably <laughs> lost my weight for too long. I mean, I, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna talk to you two again after this. This is it. I'm never coming back. But um, Carlos, I just want to say real quick, uh, Warwick Hills was very soft. Uh, a lot of rain up there. Uh, they were just firing at the pins. Uh, the ball was just uh, setting right in there. Um, Jim Furyk was having a blast. He said it was like the first day of high school, seeing all his old buddies out there and playing. He he really enjoyed it. So I don't think we're going to see Jim Furyk back on the regular tour that much. Maybe an occasional start here and there when they really need to fill out a field, but uh, or on a course that he feels good, maybe like like a Hilton Head or something like that. But uh, I, I, my question is, uh, do you think that maybe we've just seen the next Hale Irwin or the next Bernhard Langer with Jimmy Furyk because he's in really good shape. He's a he's a really nice player. He's got game. Uh, I, he could run off a bunch of wins on the Champions Tour. You think oh, Fred, so? I've got here on my notes about that point, as I think Jim Furyk is very Langer-esque uh, in terms of yep. how he plays, gritty. how he conducts yeah, himself. Focused. He's yeah. gritty. Yep. He, he, he focuses over he, – he doesn't waste shots. He yep. gives the exact same attention over a four-foot putt as he will a drive or a, a long iron. So he gives that same attention over every single shot. He's in great shape, like Langer is. And I could certainly see if Furyk can get the, the putter hot, I think he's going to be very hard to beat on the Champions Tour going forward. But you mentioned Warwick Hills, you know, Fred. You know, Furyk has some great history there. He won the Buick back in 2003. So the golf course that he obviously knew very well and liked, had a great affinity with. But, um, yeah, I think, obviously, all these players, when they turn 50, we all think, well, is he going to be the guy? I think Jim Furyk might actually be the guy to really be successful over the next five to ten years on the Champions Tour. But elsewhere, Carlos, there are actually two other uh, debutants on the Champions Tour: uh, Mike Weir and KJ Choi. Uh, they're both they both turned fifty during the, the shutdown. Now they're back and they're made their debuts on the Senior Tour, and they both tied for twenty seventh. Um, so not quite the same heights as Jim, but um, a solid start uh, for both of those players. I think for Mike Weir who has really struggled for a long time on tour. I think the Champions Tour could be a nice reprieve for him uh, going forward. But yeah, I think Jim Furyk's going to be a really hard man to beat. Um, so yeah, I think the, 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 obviously the, the achievements of Hale Irwin and Bernhard Langer you know, may never be emulated uh, given the strength and depth on the Champions Tour we're seeing every year now. But I think Furyk just fits that profile of the way he plays, the way he conducts himself. I think he just ticks so many boxes, much like Erwin and Langer, who are both real grinders as players. That's why Erwin won three US Opens. I mean, they're just great battlers. And Jim Furyk obviously fits that bill as well. So I think he's going to be the quintessential uh, successful Champions Tour player. And obviously winning your first start, that's the way to go. Especially because he is going to be playing a lot. He's we expected that maybe from Steve Stricker, but he just doesn't want to play in the Champions Tour. But Jim Fury definitely has the game, like you guys have said. And uh, uh, he conducts himself, he, he practices, he, he exercises, he keeps himself fit. So he's going to be here for a long while. That's why I started saying, watch out, Champions Tour. Here, here's your next champion. So, hey, now at the Pinnacle Bank Championship, it was Seth Reeves for Pip, five players by a shot. For the win at the club at Indian Creek in Omaha, Nebraska, he closed with a 7-under 64 in the final round to win at 11-under. He overcame the 54-hole lead of Ryan Ruffles with the Aussie looking for his first Corn Ferry Tour win. Instead of getting the win, Ruffles finished in that five-way tie for second place with Taylor Pendrith, Nick Vogue, Carl Juan, and Tyson Alexander. For Reeves, he won the $108,000 winner's share of the $600,000 purse. So he now won, uh, earned 14 official World Golf rank point, ranking points with the win. But he more importantly earned 500 Corn Ferry Tour points, which will help him 
in his quest to earn a PGA Tour card at the end of the combined 2020-2021 season. So, Fred, this week the cut was made at even par, uh, 142, 69 players got through to the weekend, but it was Seth Reeves at the end who won. Yeah, guys, I don't, I really don't have anything to report on this other than what you were just talking about, Carlos, except for the fact that we're right down to the end of the uh, Corn Ferry Tour season. Uh, they've got the event next week, and then they go right into the final series. So uh, every, every tournament, every shot right now is really important for these guys. You're only giving out 10 cards for the PGA Tour next year. Um, so it looks like a lot of these guys are going to be returning back to the Corn Ferry. And, and I know there's, they're really trying hard, grinding to get up into those top 10 to be heading into the, to the final series. So um, it's, it's really important now for these Corn Ferry Tour guys. Any comments on that, uh, Karen? Yes, I mean, uh, for, for Seth, um, Seth Reeves, I mean, that came out of nowhere um, to shoot 64 and come from eight behind, you know, having missed six straight cuts in a row before this week. So a, a win that came from nowhere. He previously played on the PGA Tour uh, a couple of years ago. He came through the, the Tour Finals then, and um, he didn't do very well on the main tour, but uh, this might be the platform to get him back there potentially. But as Fred touched on, it's going to be very strict this season with just 10 cards available, obviously due to the unique circumstances of this particular season on all the tours. But um, disappointment, of course, for Ryan Ruffles, Carlos, as you mentioned him there, missing out on winning. He's another guy who, you know, I've heard so many great things about him, you know, when he was a teenager in Australia, he was touted as being, you know, the next big thing coming out of Australia. And he's still very, very young. I mean, it might happen. He comes from a sporting, you know, background. His parents are professional tennis players. So he has that, you know, platform behind him. But as a golfer, he's very skilled, very talented, has a great attitude. Um, so I think when he gets that first win, that could open the floodgates for, for him. But um, it's just, again, it's becoming, as I said earlier, I mean, the hardest thing is to get that first victory to establish yourself. That's why it's so impressive when you see the guys that do get it very quickly, like Hovland or Morikawa or Wolf. Um, you know, while Ruffles hasn't quite got to that level as of yet, there's no reason why he can't do that in the future. Uh, but has, obviously, it's getting that win and then potentially getting access onto the PGA Tour and that gives you that stage to fulfill your potential but it's just getting into that environment because as we all know it's more competitive than ever at all levels and just being on the PGA Tour you have to be an extraordinarily successful and talented golfer and Ryan Ruffles is very talented but he has to get that success to actually book his ticket onto the main tour. All right, with that, we wrap up our weekend backspin or the recaps of this past weekend's action. Let's go on a quick uh, forecall for the previews of what's going to happen this week. Fred, the LPGA Tour continues this week with the Marathon Classic at Highland Meadows Golf Club in Sylvania, Ohio, completing what's going to be a two-week run in the state before major championship golf comes soon after at the AIG Women's Open. So, Fred, how about the Marathon Classic? $1.7 million total purse. Winner gets 255000 35th playing of the Marathon LPPA Classic going back. It used to be the Jamie Farr, of course. Um, players from the U.S. have won 13 times, the most of any country. Uh, however, Paula Kramer was the last American to win this event back in 2008. So it's been a while since somebody from America won this event. Um, 72 holes. Um, you've got uh, the top 10 LPGA members not already exempt will earn a spot into uh, the, uh, the major championship, the AIG Women's uh, Open, the uh, British Open. So um, I, I don't know if they're going to want to travel over there, but they're going to win a spot. Uh, Highland Meadows, guys, definitely not Inverness, but it's a very, very good golf course. Uh, matter of fact, of the Marathon Classic, when it's played at Highland Meadows, uh, almost so many winners and so many of the top five finishers have won majors, either have won majors before or gone on to win majors after. Uh, say we pack, of course, one year five times. So um, this should be a very good course for Daniel Kang as well. Wouldn't be surprised to see her have another great week. Um, let's see, anything else? Oh, the defending champion, Se Young Kim, is not in town. Uh, she's staying uh, over in Korea due to travel concerns, so she's not here to... Uh, to, to defend her title. Three of the past five winners uh, from this year are in the field. Uh, Mag Madeline Sagstrom, uh, Heung Park, and Daniel Kang. And 17 of the 19 rookies on tour this year 
are will be here in Toledo this week. Kieran, any quick thoughts on the Marathon Classic? Uh, no, as I said, you know, obviously it's an event that Fred knows very well and we've heard so much about uh, through the years on the Back Nine Report. I think it's probably had more coverage than any other event I mean, on this show over the years, obviously Fred being there on its doorstep. So again, hopefully, I mean, if the LPGA can have a similar display and similar show to what they had last week, then it'll be a great event to, to watch. But um, again, that's amazing, has been an American winner for so long. So, you know, maybe this will be the week, you know, given obviously the success of Daniel Kang last week, maybe that will set the precedent for the other US players to follow. So uh, it's one to keep an eye on, certainly. Kieran, the European Tour has two events this week because there's the PGA Championship in San Francisco, but there's also yep. the English Championship as the continuation of the UK swing. So can you tell us a little bit about the English Championship? Yes, it's been played at Hanbury Manor, which is just uh, north of London in Hertfordshire. Um, it's uh, again all these venues in, uh, on the UK swing were chosen because they all have an on-site hotel, so the players can be there in a bubble essentially. They don't leave; they're there the entire week. All the officials, all the caddies, stay on site, eat on site, just among themselves in Hanbury Manor. It continues that very highly regarded uh, place for people to go and visit. It hasn't really featured prominently in professional golf before, so it's going to be interesting to see how the players do there. Uh, obviously, the field contains much of the same players that played last week. Although Lee Westwood is back in the field this week, has really been the main name in that field, the marquee name. He obviously hosted the first event uh, at Close House in the British Masters, and now he's back in this one. Obviously, missing the, the PGA Championship, he, would have, he was part of the field, but he didn't enter in the end because of, obviously, uh, travel concerns due to quarantine, etc. So he'll be the main name there and potentially the favourite. But the likes of Sam Horsfield, he's also in the field trying to build on last week's victory. So again, it's another solid event for these players, at a, 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 you know, a decent venue. And obviously at the moment, these events, you know, if you finish in the, the top five over the mini mon um, small money list for the first five events on the UK swing, it could potentially get you into the US Open. So there's a lot for these guys to play for, not just race to the buy points and world ranking points, but also if they, if they choose to do so, a good run could potentially get them into the field at Wingfoot uh, next month. So there is something to play for, so it's certainly worth paying attention to. But uh, you know, Lee Westwood, who didn't play particularly well at Close House two weeks ago, he'll be looking for a better week this week. Uh, he's, he's also, you know, talking about Colin Montgomery, etc. he's also lost a bit of weight, Westwood. He's lost about 28 pounds since lockdown began. So he's also refreshed and rejuvenated. They're all at it. I mean, me and you, Carlos, we're, we're behind the curve here. We need to catch up with everybody else. They're all doing it. So... But Westwood, he's looking good, feeling good, and he's still showing this year that he can still play to a high level. So yeah, I expect him to be among the contenders uh, this week at Hanbury Manor. Fred, the Corn Cherry Tour continues this week with the Winko Foods Portland Open, which is typically the last tournament before the Corn Cherry Tour finals. So how about the Winko Foods Portland Open presented by Kraft Hans? Bo Hogue, my guy from Ohio State. Bo Hogue was the... Uh, is the defending champion. I don't think he's in the field this week. He's playing on the PGA Tour. Um, $800,000 purse. You know, they're out in Portland. I don't know, Carlos, that's about all I got for you on the Corn Ferry Tour. Um, they're just they're just trying to get, just get some season in, get some points in, get to the final series and start over next year. Okay, talk to us about Boeing Reports. Boeing Resorts. Before we go to the par five news reporting, <laughs> the latest. I'm going to just mention real quick, Carlos, that the U.S. Amateur started uh, yesterday. The U.S. Women's Amateur started yesterday. Uh, you mentioned Ryan Ruffles, uh, Kieran. Uh, his sister uh, is one of the favorites, actually, in the U.S. Women's Amateur uh, this week. Uh, 130 golfers. You got the youngest competitors, Angela Yu, Lou, uh, Alexa Pano. We've been talking about her, both 15 years old. Grace Summerhays, 16. That's a great uh, golfing family, the Summerhayses. Um, you've got, um, there's 21 countries represented, 12 former USGA champions, two former Curtis Cup members. So you got Rachel Kane, who won the uh, Women's North and South Amateur last month, Alexa Pano. Defending champ is uh, uh, Gabriella Ruffles, I'm sorry, is her name, uh, who is the defending champion. And she's in again. So uh, leave that alone. Uh, so they've got rained out today. They couldn't get the second round in a stroke play to qualify for match play. They got to do that tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Rachel Kane is actually leading at uh, four under par right now. 
uh, tied with uh, uh, Smith. Uh, Boeing Reserve, yes. As I have been telling everyone, now is the best time to visit Northern Michigan. And Boyne has 10 courses, great accommodations, excellent dining, three spas, as well as the best value in stay and play golf. Three resorts, all within close proximity of Lake Michigan as a backdrop. The mountain is perfect for families. They got a zip line. They got a big water park. They got a beach at Deer Lake. They got a ski lift ride to the top of the mountain with a sandwich shop up there for some great views. Uh, every outdoor activity is available. Fishing, hiking, biking, horse riding, you name it, they got it. There's no reason not to go. Go to boing.com. That's B-O-Y-N-E.com right now and book your next family adventure. Guys, back to you. Let's get started now with the reporting on the Par 5 News. See, now there's the report. I know it was somewhere, so I was just trying to mix things. But anyway, let's start with the first piece of news spread. The ACC has decided to play football and the Olympic sports, but they didn't include golf. Isn't golf an Olympic sport? Um, what's going on there? Yeah, I was really sad to read this. Uh, I, I, I read this in the local newspaper last week. Uh, you know, one, one of the things, Kent State is losing three football games this year, and so they're losing over $3 million of revenue from playing other great big schools, you know, out of, out of conference games. That's like 17% of their budget. You know, we've been kind of documenting this as we go, that these schools are losing, they have to cut their athletic budgets because they're losing football revenue. Well, you know, the, the, the SEC, the ACC, these guys are not going to cut football. They're going to try and have something because they want that money. I don't know how they're going to accomplish it. But how can you do football that has a lot of contact, that's going to spread the coronavirus? I don't know how they're going to do it. They can't even get away with playing baseball, for goodness sake, where you don't even have to hardly touch each other or get close to each other. How can you play football and not do golf? How can they wipe off the golf, men's and women's golf? Because there's, there's no money in it. They got to take money from the football program to, to, to pay for it. That's why. But I, I don't know how they can do that. I would think, I would think the alumni would just be rabid uh, with, these, with these schools and the ACC. Um, you know, I, I just think it's wrong. But, uh, you know, I don't set the rules. But I, I was really surprised to read this story. I understand their problems. But uh, I, I don't know how they, how they can get away with doing that. What do you think about that, Karen? Yeah, I think Fred's correct. I mean, it seems a bit strange that, you know, golf can't be played, but, you know, football can. And also, it's not, it's not just golf. Also, uh, uh, the men's and women's tennis is also uh, going to be cancelled too. And that would seem to be a, an ideal sport where obviously you're one end of the net to the other. So that seems to be socially distanced just by definition as a sport. So... I think it's a great shame, obviously, for those players who are in those sports and uh, very disappointing for them. And, you know, Fred touched on some of the, the, the colleges involved and some of them have a great, you know, golfing heritage like, you know, Wake Forest and so on. I mean, a lot of great players have come from there through the decades and generations. So it's a shame for these players nowadays that they can't, you know, they won't be able to have that platform to compete in these events uh, this, this year, uh, which is obviously a huge deal for so many people over in the U.S. So... It doesn't make much sense, but I think as Fred touched on there, it will be an economic decision as much as anything else. And that's going to be the driving factor for so many things in life going forward. And that's going to be the, the real impact of the, the, the coronavirus pandemic, where you have, you have two impacts. Obviously, the first one is the pandemic itself and obviously the illness and loss of life and that sort of thing is obviously devastating. But going ahead, we'll see you know, economic problems and things will change and there'll be practices will be different and uh, it'll take us probably quite a few years to get back to whatever normal was before so it's uh, these little things here it's a small story in the grand scheme of things but in reality it does illustrate just uh, the impact on every aspect of life uh, that the pandemic is happening uh, particularly in the sports world. You know I want to make a point too Carlos so there was a guy that came out of Wake Forest back in the 50s um, that uh, played a little golf along the way. And uh, if he were still alive, I guarantee you that the ACC and Wake Forest would be playing golf. He would pony up the money and he would find the other guys to pony up the money to make sure that men and women's golf would be played in the ACC this year. And that is Mr. Arnold Palmer. Um, he would not have let that happen. I guarantee you if he were alive, that would not have happened. 
Totally agree. Hey, Kieran, I, I have to go first to you because I know you uh, like David Slav the third a lot, but he announced that he was going to be stepping away from his job as a full-time golf analyst for CBS Sports Golf Broadcast. He did a release uh, of his statement on Twitter. And he explained that when the PGA Tour returned in June, CBS allowed him to take some time off to focus on his family, play a few tournaments, and bring some stability back in a difficult year. And then he said, okay, this is my passion. It's still going strong. Uh, what's your take on it? I mean, is it, is it that or did he struggle really uh, doing his job there as, a, as an analyst? Uh, what, what's your take on DL3's uh, announcement? I think of all these things, it's uh, something in the middle. I think it was a mutual agreement, really, that you could, I've watched a lot of the broadcasts he's been on, and um, he, he just didn't seem very comfortable in that role. He didn't really contribute anything of any insight. He made some mistakes, but it's, it's not for everybody. I mean, it's, it's a difficult job. I mean, um, I, I couldn't imagine sitting in a booth and you're listening to so many different voices at different times. The timing has to be absolutely correct. Things will cut to you very suddenly. You have to throw it to somebody else. But then in that small window of time you have, which could be a matter of seconds, you have to know what to say and how to say it at the right time. So while Davis Love has a great you know, career, very highly respected, you know, very likable character in many ways, um, one of the most popular players on the PGA Tour with his, with his fellow players, and he is a very insightful guy uh, away from television, but it's hard to translate that, you know, personality-wise on TV. You almost have to play like a, a caricature of yourself, I think, to be a TV analyst. Um, guys have really strong personalities through the years have been successful at that. Guys who've almost played up that personality have been successful at that. Um, you know, Nick Faldo, obviously the main guy at CBS, he, he, he definitely plays a character on TV. I mean, he's almost like an actor at times, um, how over the top he is. So I don't think Davis Love has that charisma um, to really translate it. That's not to be a slight on him. Not everybody's destined to be a great TV analyst. Um, he obviously had a go at it. It wasn't quite for him. It wasn't working for them either. And you know, Davis Love has a lot has a lot of money. Very successful career. He still still has the desire to play on tour. We'll probably play more Champions Tour events going forward, which he hasn't really done too much of over the past few years. He will be playing in the PGA Championship this week. But it's funny with CBS, obviously it was a big controversy at the start of the year, Carlos, when they announced that uh, Gary McCord and Peter Costas were going to be dropped from the network, obviously, to mainstays there for literally decades. And it was sort of seen that they were stale, out of touch, and we'll try and bring in some new blood to try and freshen up a little bit. And CBS had come into a great deal of criticism by many people on for their golf coverage. And ultimately, I don't think... Uh, Costas and McCord were the problem with CBS golf coverage. I think it's actually the presentation of it is extremely problematic. I mean, there's far too many commercials. There's not enough golf shown. Uh, it's very stale the way it's formatted. Um, I think they have some very talented people working there, you know, both on and off camera. Uh, but I don't think they quite, you don't quite see the best of them. Um, so I think they could do a freshening up format rather than the announcers. But uh, I think. Davis Love, you know, very successful, you know, a great player, Ryder Cup captain. But uh, I have to be honest, I don't think the TV was quite for him. And I think he had the honesty uh, to realize that himself. Fred, what's your take on DL3's announcement? Yeah, we had been talking ever since he started doing it that it just wasn't for him. He's too nice a guy. He doesn't have the flair. He just doesn't have that outgoing personality to make it work. And you have to be in that position – you have to be a little bit controversial once in a while. And I know he wouldn't throw a player under the bus. There's no way in the world he would second guess or criticize a player on air. There's no way he would do that. And once in a while, you just have to do it, you know, if nothing else, just to stir things up a little bit, because that's what they're paid to do. And so it wasn't working. He was trying to press it and it just, it didn't work for him. He can, he can go on and do other stuff. He doesn't need that. I was really surprised when they, they said they were going to get him in the first place. Uh, if they thought McCord and, and that Casas were too stale, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it was almost like Davis was asleep half the time. So uh, it, it's a good deal for everybody. Davis can go on and do uh, other things. Really good guy. And it, this just wasn't the right, the right fit for him at all. I, I also think, other than that as well, is that 
it's it was not his time. A lot of these guys get into the into the business and they're preparing for a long time to ever get into this. He was just thrown into the wolves basically, uh, and he he still has like he's saying he also he still has his mind in playing. So he was not gonna. He might in the future be ready for it. Like you're mentioning, right now he's not gonna throw anybody under the bus because he still feels like he's part of the fields going to play. So he's not gonna try to alienate anybody uh, on the golf course yet. Maybe in the future when his playing days are over, maybe that's when he might do that. But for now, I think like, uh, I agree with you guys. It, it was just not worth it for him to stay there. Kieran, golf's most interesting man. <laughs> Miguel Angel Jimenez. You know, and you might be golf's most interesting journalist, right? So you two, Absolutely, you two yeah. guys have uh, some things in common, but he set a record by making his 707th European Tour start. So how about that by MAJ? Well, it's a fantastic achievement. Um, Sam Torrance had held the record for you know so long, you know, well over a decade. Um, you know, Sam obviously a Ryder Cup legend, a European Tour stalwart. It almost seemed like that record was going to be unassailable. Uh, but Miguel Angel Jimenez has obviously remained, you know, highly competitive, well into his fifties, still contending. He's the oldest winner on the European Tour. He's broken that record a couple of times, and he made his 707th appearance at the English Open there at the Forest of Arden. And he began it in unbelievable fashion, you know, shooting 64, bogey-free on Thursday. And obviously, with the circumstances at the moment, there was no crowds there. But all the players who were in the field came out to watch him finish his round on Thursday, give him that ovation, which he certainly appreciated. They presented him with a nice glass of wine, naturally. And he had a little Zoom call, I think, with uh, Sam Torrance to uh, congratulate each other. But the great thing about that was, you know, Sam Torrance, you know, I'm obviously sophisticated. I have a very well-spoken Scottish accent. And Sam, not so much. Sam's a little bit more gruff. He's from the other side of the country. Um, so Sam's there on the, on the Zoom talking away to Miguel. And Miguel, Miguel's got a very unique way of speaking English, uh, it has to be said. And the thing is, Miguel's English is far better than my Spanish, so I'm not going to criticise him. But he does speak in his own way. So you had him trying to speak, Sam trying to speak over a bad bad line and it was delightfully awkward both with wine in hand they're both saying hey so neither of them knew what each other were saying but I think the sentiment was, was clear that they were both proud of each other so you know for Miguel Angel coming off it's a fantastic achievement and just to kind of delve into his career Carlos just quickly and uh, obviously he's a you know larger than life character very popular very unique individual has a wonderfully refreshing view on life you know while I'm not going to run out and smoke cigars or drink wine or have my hair like that or indeed stretch like that before my round I do enjoy his just he, so, such a relaxed perspective on life but we forget that he's also an, an exceptional golfer uh, he was fantastic for so long I mean he, he made his debut on the tour back in 1983 at the Spanish Open he won his first event at the Belgian Open in 1992 only nine players have won more European tour events than Miguel you know, the oldest winner on tour, age 50, when he won in Spain six years ago. You know, 20 runner-up finishes, 110 top 10s, 533 cuts. Uh, obviously now a, a major champion on the senior tour, Ryder Cup player, represented Spain with great distinction uh, in World Cups and Dunhill Cups past. So Miguel Angel Jimenez, I mean, he's a guy who certainly, you know, you know got better as he's gotten older. Um, but what a career he's had. Uh, what a personality he is, and uh, it was a great to see last week, certainly on Thursday, it was very much the Miguel show, and I think the players coming out and the way they organised it and showing that respect, I think it was a great scene, and I think he certainly appreciated it, and all the messages he had from all different players, you know, Jack Nicholas sent a message to him, Rory McIlroy, all these different guys, all congratulating him on the prize, on the achievement. It is a great achievement to be there around for that long, to be that competitive, that consistent for decades i mean literally it's, it's better part of 40 years since he made his debut on tour in 1983 so and he's still you know playing extremely very good golf so and there's more to come from him too and you know he'll certainly be competitive going forward he's playing this week at the english championship so he's making cuts he's scoring well 
you know, who knows, he could you know, get back into the mix on the regular tour one more time, almost certainly. But of course, when he goes back over to the US and plays in the Champions Tour, he's certainly one of the players to beat there. So yeah, Miguel Angel Jimenez, you know, I don't drink, but I do raise a glass to Miguel because uh, that's a great achievement. A virtual glass is raised to him, Fred. I mean, that I is a testament also of his, I mean, I mean, to do so many starts, you have to, first of all, you have to give your card. You, you have to keep playing well to maintain your card for so many years and you have to stay healthy. So there's a lot of a lot of great things that MAJ is doing to uh, hold this record now. Well, I mean, he bridges the, gra the gap from uh, from Arnold and Jack to Gary to Seve to Westwood to Rory and the, and the young guys now. Uh, you know, just unbelievable long career. And to stay on tour that long, most guys, if they can come out and if they can stay for three or four or five years, they make enough money, they want to go retire and go do something else. No, he just, and he travels the world. It's not like he's playing just in America. He's all over the world. Uh, so a lot of travel, a lot of airplanes. And the other thing that caught my eye, uh, you know, with 108 uh, top tens uh, that he's had of the 533 cuts, that's one in five. 20% of the time that he makes a cut, he's finishing top 10. That's, that's unbelievably consistent play. Uh, over 24 million euro that he's won in his career. He's also won nine times on the Champions Tour. So um, just a phenomenal player, a lot of fun to watch. We, we get a real kick out of him. And, uh, and, and good for him. Congratulations to uh, Miguel and Hell Jimenez, the most interesting man in golf. All right. Fred, I know you like this subject, so I'm going to give you the first shot at it. And Webb Simpson apparently has this answer. He has figured it out. What everybody has to, to do with the relating to the golf's distant debate. And uh, we have been talking about the high-tech golf balls and, you know, the, the, the club hits, let's roll back that, the, the ball, or hey, let's just bulk up like Bryson DeChambeau or go to, you know, gym memberships and all that. But he said, you know, no, you, you don't have to do any of that. And he used this week's PGA Championship at TPC Harding Park as an example that better golf course design and not more rules and regulations is what the answer to the increasing driving distances. So, how about Webb? By the way, Webb is not among the PGA Tour's longest hitters, so he obviously has to say something on the other country. So he says, hey, better golf design is the answer to this. Yeah, um, you're exactly right. He's not one of the bombers. and But we've seen this act before, right? Um, didn't they used to try and tiger-proof golf courses by – making them tougher out farther out putting more bunkers out there and uh, making him play maybe he's such a good if the guy is a good short iron player and a good chipper and a good potter it doesn't matter where you put the bunkers they'll figure out how to get the ball up to the green um i, I don't know you know this is you know it's one issue right it, it as we talk about this distance issue it's not just one thing the guys are more fit Yes, the balls travel a little farther. Yes, the equipment's better. Yes, they're better trained. Yes, the golf courses are in better condition, better shape. They're firmer, faster, all this kind of stuff. The greens are better. They roll better. They make more putts. Um, so it's a multifaceted uh, issue. It's just not one thing. So you can talk about golf course design, maybe putting in a few more strategic bunkers. Jack is going to change the bunkering and some of the stuff on his golf course at Muirfield Village. If you notice, uh, even before the last pot drop, they were out there tearing up the 16th green. They're going to change a bunch of stuff and do some renovation to Muirfield Village. So that kind of stuff goes on all the time. But to just put mass bunkering and different stuff out, it's not going to matter unless they put these giant, huge lips on them because the guys are just as good out of the bunkers now as they are from any place else. So as long as they can see the back of their golf ball, as long as they can walk up and see the white on the back of the ball, golf ball, they've got a shot. They've got a chance. And most of those guys are good enough that they can make something happen. Uh, so I don't know that just putting more bunkers or changing the courses around a lot uh, are going to be the answer, more dog legs. 
it does make a difference. We saw this uh, the first four events this year when they came back, um, you know, like at, at, at the Hilton Head and down in Texas and up, at, uh, up in New Jersey. Uh, those are tighter golf courses. They require more ball placement off the tee. But still, I mean, we saw Dustin Johnson win. We saw, you know, some longer players win. So these guys know how to get around. They'll take care of it. This isn't the only answer, although it is one part of the total answer, Carlos. Kieran, this week we're going to see what he's saying. You know, there's going to be a premium on fairways. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, tree lines there at TPC Harding Park, uh, like what he calls his old school golf. Is that the answer to the distance debate? No, I don't. I don't think so. It's certainly not. Um, you know, on on its own, I think Fred's correct, and it is a multifaceted issue, and there is no blanket answer to solve uh, the problem. If indeed you see it. Hold it, hold it, Pierre, hold it. You are agreeing with Fred? <laughs> it happens more often than you think. I don't usually admit it, but it does happen. I can't, and the thing is, now we're on the Zoom calls, I can't hide my agreement. I do nod my head occasionally. <laughs> or is it just indigestion? I'm not sure, but the two kind of go hand in hand when I'm listening to Fred talk. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think it's an odd... I, I, these I, little I'm pearls of wisdom, Kieran, are just for you. These little <sighs> pearls this is why I sp I'm up half the night listening to you. This is it. This is, this is what I pay my money for. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Webb Simpson comments, I don't quite understand what he was really talking about as such. And uh, we'll wait and see how it, this week plays out. I mean, he's talking about being a premium on, on accuracy. Well, Bryson DeChambeau, for what it's worth, said earlier today, he's going to take the driver and just smash it everywhere because as far as he's concerned, the rough isn't really that thick at Harding Park. So we'll see how that plays out for him. But yeah, um, yeah, it's just, I think you talk about constantly having to renovate golf courses and adding new bunkers here, there, everywhere, adding new tees. Where does it end? You know, it's not sustainable from a financial point of view. You're making golf courses bigger. You're adding more bunkers in. You look at Augusta National. I mean, as one chap um, so wonderfully described on Twitter, he says in response to Webb's comments, he said, ah, yes. If only Dr. Alistair McKenzie had only been a better designer of golf courses, Augusta National wouldn't have to buy every surrounding house and Taco Bell to make rooms for new tees. I mean, Augusta National spending literally tens of millions of dollars to expand their perimeter, to constantly expand, expand golf the golf holes, um, increasing the yardage all the time. So, which is not an answer. There has to be, there has to be a breaking point. Um, either we have to accept the guys are going to drive the ball so far and they're going to tear golf courses apart. Or well, there's three options really. One, you can do that to accept it. Two, you can change the golf ball and try and change the equipment for the top players. Or three, you can make golf courses ludicrously difficult by you know bringing in the rough, knee-high rough, making the greens extremely firm and fast. A little bit like what we saw at Muirfield Village uh, during the memorial where, where Jack obviously decided, well, no one's shooting 20 under par this week. I'm going to make this golf course virtually dead by Sunday because uh, it's getting torn up tomorrow anyway. Um, and that's the only way you're going to keep the scores you know, relatively in check as such going forward. But is that a good thing to watch? Do you really want to watch the guys week in, week out grinding like that? Is it really the way the golf courses should be played? I mean, some of these golf courses from back in the day are so wonderfully artistically laid out. You know, the bunkering is exquisite and fantastic. Um, the greens are so imaginative. And I think if we start going down this extreme route of course setups for the top players, then we lose that. And also, if you're a member of one of these golf courses as a regular player, do you really want to play somewhere that's having to grow so much rough and change the entire layout of the golf course just to suit guys for one week of a year? It's just so many questions about this that, that are just hard to answer. So, uh, yeah, I think that it's a little bit glib from Simpson saying, though, that this better golf course design doesn't really mean very much. I mean, now you didn't explain it particularly well. There's much more to it than that. Um, the guys on tour don't really see there being a problem because they're making lots of money. They're successful. That's great. And a lot of the golf fans don't really see it being a problem either. I think, you know, I'm certainly one of them. I, I'm one of the people who is very critical of the way the game is going in terms of the equipment and the, what's happening to golf courses. But I do think that perspective is actually a niche. I think there is that kind of golf geeky, you know, kind of the, the, the golf nerds who are really into the golf course architecture and stuff. 
I think, and I'm one of them, I think we're the ones who are very critical of all the way the game is right now. And while it's still a very loud voice, I think it is probably a smaller voice than people think. I think most golf fans just watch and just don't really care one way or the other. Um, and the players, if they're still making lots of money, they don't care either. So, yeah, I don't see an easy answer for this one. Um, but I do think something has to be done because when I, I, I see golf courses on TV, some classic designs that just are not being played the way they should be played. It's quite sad. I remember watching uh, the Open Championship at Carnoustie two years ago. And Carnoustie is one of those golf courses that's still very difficult, particularly in bad weather. But I'm watching guys take drivers off the tee and they're just hitting the ball 50 yards over the most wonderfully presented bunkers. And I'm thinking, you know, it's getting to the stage where the guys on tour now, the elite players, they're playing a game that almost isn't golf. Um, the lesser players who actually hit the ball on the ground, who actually use the contours, who actually are bunkers are in play, it's almost as if we're actually playing a game now that's closer to what golf once was and maybe it should be. Whereas the guys on tour now are more or less playing you know, drive simulator just on a golf course. Just, you know, bomb it and gouge it out and that's it. There's not much finesse involved. That said, you know, driving the ball long distances is an immense skill that should not be downplayed whatsoever. You know, what Bryson Shambo has done is extraordinary. Um, he deserves enormous credit for that. Um, so I'd never downplay the importance of long driving. That should still be a skill. But when it becomes the only skill that matters, really, the top 10 players in the game, then I think it becomes a little bit of a problem. You know, there's not much finesse or strategy at times, and uh, we're losing that. And I don't think golf is better for it as a spectator sport. Uh, it could be so much more interesting. I mean, you can't tell me that golf you know, was less interesting 20 years ago or even 30, 40, 50 years ago. The players back then were so wonderfully creative and fascinating to watch and imaginative. We don't have that now, and it's not a fault of the players. It's just the way the game is. And I think the players of today are almost shortchanged as well because I think the great players of today will be the great players of yesterday as well. Uh, but we're not able to see them use a variety of skills because at the moment, the way the game is, you know, the, the skills that are required are fewer than what I think they used to be. All right. So, Fred, can you believe, is it true that the PGA Tour is taking a softer... I, I don't know if we can actually say softer and PGA Tour on the same sentence. Is that right? They, are they taking a softer stance on the positives on the test? Just, just a little bit, guys, just a little bit. Uh, even though we're seeing uh, upticks on the uh, numbers of the coronavirus cases in a lot of states, um, some states are not excited about accepting interstate travel or travelers from New York or Florida right now, um, because those states are so uh, so heavily testing positive. Uh, the PGA Tour is relaxing some of the requirements for those that do test positive. Uh, Bob Herrig uh, reported uh, that uh, they're, they're allowing players that have tested positive to intermingle with their peers within 24 hours of having a fever, uh, even if they do continue to test positive. They're going to be allowed to use the clubhouse and the locker room will not be separated with special tea times. Um, and the, the policy goes into effect, uh, went into effect last week uh, at the two tournaments last week. So um, I, I don't know. I, you know, we're all doing this thing. We're wearing our mask. We're staying distant. We're doing all these things and they keep easing this up. So this sends a mixed message to me, Carla. So I want to know it, is this stuff not as severe as we had been to, led to believe? It is as, not as easily passed on as we have been led to believe? Is the testing not as accurate as it should be? And I've got some comments on that. There are a lot of false positives. Uh, and maybe some smart people are beginning to figure out that some of this maybe has been just a little bit overblown. So um, as you know, the LPGA has been in town for the last two weeks. Uh, Mike May, our good friend from Florida, is working with a company now that's doing the electronic scoring for the LPGA event. So he had been in town. And so he had he, he needed to have some laundry done. He had gone through all his clothes. He still had another week here in town. So he says, hey, hey, can I, can I come out and use your washer and dryer? So we had him out Sunday morning for breakfast, and uh, we washed his clothes. And so he had to leave before they were, were done through the dryer. I said, don't worry. I'll bring him down to the hotel. We'll drop him off. 
So uh, in the afternoon, my wife and I drove downtown at the, to the hotel, and all the, all the girls are staying there. Pretty much all the LPGA people are staying there. And I'm dropping this stuff off at the, uh, the desk, and Michael Wan was standing there. And so I chatted up Michael for a minute. We were talking, and I was asking about testing. As you know, I think Gabby, uh, Gabby Lopez tested positive. So she had to, she had to withdraw. Um, but um, he said, you know, we're really not, we really thought we were going to be in pretty good shape for especially the first couple of weeks. We're all kind of being combined here in Toledo. We're in one place, we're in one hotel. Uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape. But when we start moving around and start traveling some more, that's when we're worried. And guys, we're supposed to, they're supposed to come over to, uh, to Scotland for a couple of weeks for the uh, Scottish Open, Women's Scottish Open and the, uh, and the AIG uh, Women's British Open. Uh, and then they're supposed to go to Asia for four weeks. And, and Mike was talking about being concerned about going over there and traveling. And I said, I don't think you're gonna have to worry about it. But, uh, cause I think they're gonna, you're gonna have to cancel those events. I can't imagine they're gonna be traveling to Asia to play golf over there. So I can't imagine too many of the women are gonna be wanting to travel to Scotland to play golf. But um, as far as the PGA Tour, amid all this stuff, they're easing up some of these regulations, which it's kind of surprising me, guys. Very, very surprising. All right. So any comments on that, uh, Kieran, before we move on? Well, I, I think Fred sums it up very well. Um, to me, you know, See, you know, once again, see, he Stop we're doing like, this to me, Fred. Stop we're doing like this. Brothers from a different mother or something. Well, so, so, given the age difference between you and me, that must have been some mother. I mean, that's quite... <laughs> or, you know, so... Um, our dad was very busy for you know a long time. Clearly, very active into senior Poor years. But um, woman. yeah, but um, so no, I think for me it's obviously it's very complicated. And I think you know generally speaking, I think the the tours have done a good job in getting the game back. Uh, when you see other sports in the U.S. where there's ten, you know, I've seen baseball and so on, where the tests are huge and there's guys who are testing positive all the time. The golfers have been very relatively disciplined. Um, with what they've done. I think in, in the early stages of the PGA Tour's return, return, I think they were a little bit careless at times, but I think they learned their lesson, particularly after Hilton Head, where I think the players themselves are very uncomfortable with the, the environment there, with how busy it was. Um, so since then, I think they've done okay. Uh, to me, I would always err towards the side of caution with these things and, and try and... I, I, don't, I don't really see the need to change the regulations. Um, if, if it's been given on obviously scientific advice and what the experts say, then that's fair enough. But I do think if I was uh, the tour's administrators, I would just stick to what they were doing for as long as possible uh, for the remainder of this season and then see where we are going forward. Because uh, obviously, you know, this is not going to disappear overnight. I mean, we will be living with the virus and the pandemic uh, for some degree or another, you know, it's almost certainly until a large period of next year. Um, until I see a vaccine becomes available and then until it's actually widely administered, it's going to be the second part of that equation. So until that actually happens, we're going to have to learn to live with this. And I think the tours have done a relatively good job at it. Um, so hopefully, you know, it makes sense of what they've done. They've changed that I wouldn't rush out and make changes already. I think it's still too soon. Uh, but if it has been given on scientific advice, and they do say that people who have tested positive are not symptomatic after a certain stage. If that is the case and they can't pass it on, then fair enough. But uh, I say I would stick to the, the cautious side of the argument. I think that's just the, the safest place to be, uh, particularly when players are traveling cross country. I know some players were obviously concerned about going over to uh, California and San Francisco this week, where obviously there's a, a spike in cases and so on there. So it's a, it's a complicated subject, but I think it's one that the, the tours are trying to navigate and uh, hopefully they've taken the, the best advice for that. And um, players will just do what they've been told to do. And if they do that, then, as, as I said the whole time, I mean, the virus itself, it can't get on a bus, it can't get on a plane and travel to see you. It's people who pass it on to other people. So if everyone does what they're supposed to do in terms of hygiene, distancing, wearing masks in appropriate places, if we all do that um, and do the right thing, protect ourselves, protect those closest to us, and then ultimately protect each other, then we'll be in a better place. But uh, unfortunately, some people do let us down at times. Um, but yeah, hopefully the, the changes on tour will make sense and uh, we won't see any negative uh, impact of it. All right, and now it's time for what everybody's been waiting for. It's the practice range, the main topic. 
finally, finally, when after over a year, we have a major golf tournament to enjoy. It's the PGA Championship, which is the first major of the season being played at TPC Harding Park in San Francisco. I mean, Brooks Kepka is going for the three-peat, having won the event in 2019 and 2018. We're looking forward to see him and uh, Tiger Woods. All the big-time players are going to be there. But, Kieran, this is the 102nd edition of the PGA uh, Championship. So tell us a little bit about the history of the tournament. Yeah, well, as you say, Carlos, 102nd edition this year. PGA Championship dates back to the midst of the, the First World War, back to 1916. So it's been around for a long time now. It is the third oldest of our established majors. And it has been you know, a, a part of the schedule for a very long time and also a prominent one. I mean, the idea, as we all know by now, any person who's kind of read about the game in the past will know that the, the, the major championships that we know today weren't really established as such until the early 1960s. I mean, they were big events. Uh, they weren't really majors. I mean, the US Open, uh, the Open Championship, you know, the, the PGA, but there are also other events like the Western Open and so on that were also very prominent back in the day. So the idea of a major was not really established until much later in time. But that said, the PGA has obviously been a huge event for so long, particularly, of course, because in the early stages of it, back in the early half of the 20th century, the players were club professionals and they were joined at the hip as club professionals and tour professionals they, they more or less were the same thing you know, all players had a golf club that they were based at and that's they, they played some tournaments they went back to the club and you know Byron Nelson I think is always the, the best example of that as being a, a club pro who obviously became you know, one of the best players of all time but and the PGA Championship was really their event it was a stage for you know, professional golfers who at that time were almost second-class citizens. I mean, the, the amateur players, amateur golf was where the money was. It was a rich guy's game. A lot of the top amateur players were extremely wealthy uh, and successful in other fields in the game or in life. You know, obviously, Bobby Jones being a, a fine example of that. So the, the, the tour players or the professional golfers didn't really have an avenue to make money, uh, and the PGA Championship was an example of that. And so the first event was held back in 1916. You know, the trophy was ultimately donated um, um, by, by, by Mr. Wanamaker, whose first name I have completely forgotten at this point in time, which I feel very bad about. I'll try and remember his first name. I will do by the end of my speech here. Um, but yeah, Rodman Wanamaker. There we go. Thank you very much. So he donated a gold medal after the first event, which was won in New York by Jim Barnes, an Englishman. He, had, he, he won $500 for that. But then, of course, the Wanamaker trophy, that huge trophy became the thing. But for the first few decades of its time, the PGA was a match play event. Um, but then, of course, by the time TV came along in the 1950s, match play was deemed to be not quite as attractive uh, for, the, for the viewing audience, so that they made it into a standard stroke play championship. So the PGA mm -hmm. is, you know, in some respects, it's also been kind of the least distinctive of the four majors. It doesn't have the, the grandeur of the Masters. It doesn't have the status of being, obviously, the America's national event, like the US Open does. And it doesn't have, obviously, the history of the Open Championship and the uniqueness of the Open. But the PGA has always been a very solid event. It's always boasted what they call the strongest field in golf, inviting, generally speaking, the world's top 100 players. And it's had some tremendous you know, champions through the, through the years. You know, going back to obviously Walter Hagen in its early times and obviously Jack Nicholas and Tiger Woods and Lee Trevino. You know, all these guys have won this event multiple times. In more recent times, obviously, Rory McIlroy has won it twice. You know, before that, VJ Singh, Nick Price, international winners too. You know, played mostly in the eastern US, but of course this year we're going back to the West Coast, first time in quite a long time for the PGA, so something a little bit different. But the PGA Championship, you know, it's um, it's an event for for the club professionals who, of course, play a prominent part in the in the event. Twenty club pros from the PGA of America are part of the field. It's obviously a great honour for them to be part of that and it adds that unique flavour to the event and celebrates, of course, uh, those individuals who uh, you are, are a real you know, lifeblood of golf clubs and golf facilities around the country and indeed around the world where you know, they help people get into the game and are really the ones who introduce the game and coach golfers and just, you know, are, are a vital part of the sport. So the PGA Championship is a celebration of that. But it's obviously also a, you know, an excellent event. It's one of four majors and you know, people always say, well, if you could pick one major, the PGA might not be the one you would choose unless you have 
history of being in the PGA of America, but the reality is you don't get to pick. It's one of golf's four biggest events and it has a great history to it. And if you win the PGA Championship, you're part of history. And you know the, it's a great opportunity this week for someone to join that history. Um, but I say it's had a great stature throughout the year, some great champions through the decades, and has had some you know memorable moments. People tend to remember you know great masters or great opens, but you know, the PGA has had some you know, exciting finishes through the years. And I think in, in some respects, actually in the past sort of 10 to 15 years, I feel the event has actually become you know, more elevated in some respects. I think the, um, the US Open um, has made some missteps over the past uh, decade or so in terms of the courses they've been to, in terms of the setups they've had, in terms of the finishes that they've had. And I think in that respect, the PGA Championship, um, it's more of a, a regular tour event that's somewhat amped up a little bit. Um, but I think the players generally enjoy that. It's something they're more used to, they're more accustomed to that challenge. Uh, and generally speaking, it, it tends to reward some very good players. There have been some surprise winners through the years, of course, but you see the list of champions at the PGA. And it tends to be a young man's title as well. I mean, older players have done very well in the Open or the other Masters over the years, but the last 10 years or so, you know, it's really been a young guy's event, the PGA. So, um, Maybe that shows you it's kind of the it's the most modern of the majors, I guess, in some respects, and the way it's set up. Um, but yeah, a great history to it, Carlos. But um, coming to Harding Park, obviously, a new venue for the PGA, a public venue, which we'll get into shortly, uh, a new chapter for the PGA. But you know, obviously being the first major of this extraordinary season, this unique year, that in itself elevates it even further. There won't be any fans there, won't have that atmosphere to it, but... On Sunday, you know, someone's going to lift the Wanamaker Trophy and become part of history. And indeed, they'll become part of a unique part of history as they will be the first major champion of this extraordinary year. And the 2020 will be a year none of us will forget. Uh, but nonetheless, the players have an opportunity uh, to you know, etch their name and achieve that little bit of sporting immortality. So um, you know, the Wanamaker Trophy is the biggest trophy you know, in major golf. And uh, someone will be lifting it on Sunday. So that's what we're here for. So, yeah, that's uh, all good. Hopefully they're not too tired by Sunday. But anyway, yeah. for the course is TPC Harding Park. It's not overly long at just over 700, 7,200 yards. The fairways, I was looking at them. They look, too, they look slim uh, and there's thick rough. So it should suit players whose games are built around accuracy and consistency. So... Tell us about the a little bit about the course and also that CBS is now taking the lead on the wire to wire coverage for the TV coverage here. Yeah, Harding Park is owned by the city of San Francisco. It's it's a public uh, municipal owned golf course. It's operated by the Tour Players uh, uh, Corporation, the TPC. Uh, so it is a it, they've upgraded it, they've renovated it. It's, it's really really nice. We've seen it over the past few years hosting some some very good tournaments. It was opened in 1925, actually. So it's an old, old golf course. And it sits right there around Lake Merced. And there are several great golf courses there. Uh, the Olympic Club is right beside there. As a matter of fact, the same guys that built uh, the Olympic Club also designed and built uh, Harding Park. Um, you've also got the Lake Merced golf course, which we see a uh, – uh, an LPGA tour event played there every year. So it's a, it's, it's around this lake, it's a park area, and there's a lot of great golf courses right there. Uh, they've hosted several major events uh, in the past. Um, in 2005, they had a WGC American Express Championship there. Uh, Tiger Woods outlasted John Daly. You know, I was really surprised, Kieran, when you talked about the history of the PGA and the past winners, you didn't mention, you failed to mention John Daly. I was really, really quite shocked at that, actually. Um, the course also hosted the, a WGC Cadillac match play in 2015. Um, and so it, it's, and it's going to be, a, the President's Cup's going to be out there in 2025. So we're, we're, we're seeing it hosting a lot of stuff. Uh, it's a TPC course, so it, it's got a little higher profile. CBS, yes. Uh, CBS and ESPN are taking the lead. They've got this new big deal uh, to, uh, to do the, uh, the PGA Championship. And uh, they're going to have, um, uh, what is this, uh, 170 
cumulative hours of live coverage. That's a lot of golf on TV, guys. I don't think I'll catch every hour of that. Um, you've got 97 top 100 players there. It's going to be broadcast in prime time on both ESPN and CBS because it's on the West Coast, the East Coast, and here in the, in the Midwest. We're going to get it in the evening, which will be kind of nice. Uh, we're not, you know, if you're working during the day, you want to do some that you can do it, sit on your couch and eat and drink a couple beers and watch a little golf. Um, it's going to be streamed live. It's going to be on your TV. Uh, you got Amanda Balealis and all the CBS guys, Nick Faldo and hello, friends, Jim Nance there. So it's going to be big. Um, I don't know what to tell you. You're going to have it. Uh, they're going to have this show on. Uh, actually, well, it was on last Saturday, the, the kind of a preview show. But then beginning on Thursday, it starts at 10 a.m. in the morning uh, on ESPN+. Plus. Then at 4, it goes to ESPN 4 to 10. Um, same thing on Friday on ESPN Plus during the early part of the day. And then 4 to 10. Uh, so 12 hours on ESPN and ESPN Plus that it's on. And then beginning on Saturday and Sunday, CBS picks it up at 4 p.m. on Saturday. And they pick it up at 3 on um, on Sunday. It doesn't end till 9 p.m. here on the East Coast uh, on, on Sunday night. But it starts at 10, 11 a.m. in the morning on ESPN Plus and ESPN. So it's just round-the-clock coverage from CBS and ESPN all week long, guys. Now let's get into the storylines here. And uh, I'm just going to mention five, which I think are the highlights of it. Because uh, obviously Brooks Kepka is trying to go for three-peat. Uh, he would become the first man since Walter Hagen to win three consecutive PGA championships. And, of course, this course, if you look at it, the setup, it looks to be fairly similar to Beth, Play, Beth, Page, Black, Beth Page Black last year with the thick uh, rough and narrow fairway. So it could suit his game. Let's see if he goes for it. Roy McIlroy, wow, it's been six years. Can you believe that? Six years since he last won a major. His last major, of course, came in August 2014 at Valhalla when he had uh, Phil Mickelson. Uh, Henrik Stenson and Ricky Fowler to win his second PGA Championship. This is a PGA Championship, so and he's coming under the radar, so maybe that will help him, even though he's not been playing well. But six years, incredible. Tiger Woods, will he win number 16? Well, we know he won. He shocked everybody winning the Masters last year. Uh, if he's able to win now, he will win number 16 and also will take him uh, tied with Jack Nicklaus Jack Nicholas and Hagen as the only players to win five PGA championships. So that is interesting to see if he goes and, and tries to win. He would overtake Sam Snead for his 83rd win. And, hey, he has good history playing here. So who knows? Maybe it will work. Maybe it won't. Now, the number one spot in the world is off for grab. JT comes off uh, on top after this week, leapfrogging uh, John Ram. But he uh, Ram got only there after a couple of weeks. Uh, I go after overtaking uh, Roy McIlroy, who had held the position since February. So there's a, a battle there. John Ram, Roy McIlroy, Webb Stimson, and Dustin Johnson, all four have a chance. That's going to be interesting to see. Will we see a first-time major winner? I mean, there's some incredible talents near the top of the game right now. And the likes of John Ram, Bryson DeChambeau, Sanders Shoffley, Patrick Cantley, Colin Morikawa. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood, Tyrell Hatton, Hideki Matsuyama, all of them are yet to taste major glory. And for the last three years, 50% of the major winners have been first-time winners in the last 20 years. 50% of the PGA Championship winners have been also first-time major champions. So, uh, Fred, what's your major stories uh, going into this uh, tournament? Well, number one, of course, Brooks Kepka's chance of the 3P, which we've talked about, documented. Um, his results uh, since we came back, since golf restarted, had not been that great. Uh, his finishes in order were uh, 32nd, a 7th, a missed cut, 62 at the Memorial, missed cut at the 3M, and then the runner-up last week in which he finally looked halfways like what he's normal of doing. So he's trending upward. This might be a good, good thing for him. Um, we've got uh, Tiger. Um, Tiger's chances, uh, they, they've got to be very slim, but it's never a good idea 
to count Tiger Woods out of anything ever, even though this will only be his fourth start this year. Um, his last start was at the Memorial. Um, his, uh, you know, it's it just, it hasn't been working. His back was an issue at the Memorial. Um, but if he could somehow manage to put his game, get a game together and, and get it around, if he would happen to win this week, oh my goodness, what a story that would be. So also the odds are against him. It's been 30 years since someone won a major over the age of 43. Um, so it's, you know, you, it just, it just doesn't happen. There's not that many majors won once you reach the age of 40. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, what else have I got here? Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave those. Those are my main storylines right there, guys, of the of things that I'm going to kind of watch for. Karen, which are your main storylines that you're going to be watching for this week? Well, I think actually one main storyline for me is not necessarily a player, just more the event itself. And um, we've also become very accustomed over the past two months or so to having tour events without fans being there. And the players have become used to that atmosphere or lack of atmosphere. And I've also generally performed very well in that. But there are some players who have said that maybe it hasn't quite suited them. You know, Rory McIlroy is certainly one of them. He has not come back particularly well from the, the, the shutdown, obviously, before. He'd been in sparkling form, the world number one, hasn't played very well since he came back. And part of that, he said, in the press is to do with he hasn't had that spark. You know, playing in a regular tour event, he hasn't been feeling motivated, really, as he would normally do so. Uh, so this week, he obviously coming into a major. He hasn't won for six years. He won the PGA, of course, at, at Valhalla. But coming in here, will he find that spark? Or will all the players find that spark? Will they psychologically elevate it? Because it, it's not just that the fans aren't there. The infrastructure isn't there. The, the stands aren't there. The hospitality isn't there. All this stuff isn't there. The merchandise tent isn't there. All the stuff that you would see at a major that makes it feel elevated from any other event isn't there. So obviously the players know it's a major, they know they feel strong, they know the prize is there, the money's great, the trophy is waiting for them. Someone is going to have that little piece of history. But it doesn't quite feel the same. So I'm intrigued to see how that plays out. Will we see perhaps a lesser known player or a younger player perhaps deal better with the situation and what they would do in a normal environment? Or will we see one of the top players, will they be able to find that extra gear that they can do in the big atmosphere. I mean, certain players undoubtedly feed off the atmosphere and feed off the crowd. I mean, look at Tiger Woods, for example. He is so used to playing in a, this weird bubble where he's surrounded by thousands of people who are staring at him and the atmosphere is extraordinary. He isn't playing in that environment. Um, so I'm fascinated by that dynamic of it. But in terms of the individual players, Carlos, I think Fred's touched on them, and you, you, did, you did as well, obviously, the, the main favourites, the main storylines. I mean, Justin Thomas, world number one, having just won WGC there. I mean, the likes of Rory and Tiger have done that double before, winning WGC and winning the PGA. That's obviously kind of the ironic thing is, the PGA is a, has been reverted back, essentially, to its old date in August, which it just left, really. So it's uh, the one event that's actually kind of been readjusted back to what it used to be. So during this bizarre schedule that we've had. So Justin Thomas obviously playing extremely well, very confident, a guy who's won here before, won this event before. As discussed earlier, he's a closer, he's a winner. Uh, he'll be hard to beat. He has all the attributes and tools required to succeed. Again, has Jim Bones Mackay on the bag this week. So that has that huge experience and that kind of calmness there. And that kind of, uh, you know, it's interesting because um, Previously, you know, Jimmy Johnson is, you know, Justin's regular caddy. And Jimmy's, a, as far as I know, is a very different personality from, from Bones. I mean, Jimmy Johnson's a very, kind of, doesn't say very much, is very quiet, just says the right thing. Whereas Bones is a little bit more talky on the golf course. And we'll see how that different environment, that, that different approach plays out. Obviously, last week it worked very well. We'll see how it does this week at the PGA. But Brooks Kepka, of course, is the story because... I mean, coming in here, going through the, the treble of victories, I mean, that would be a, an astonishing achievement. You know, no one's done that in a major since Peter Thompson won three Open Championships in a row back in the mid-1950s. Walter Hagen did it. He won four PGAs in a row back in the 1920s. So Kepka is in, you know, trying to join some very rare company uh, in this modern game to win three 
of the same major in a row would be uh, astonishing. And I think there's it, a very good chance of it. I think the way he played last week is a, a real reason to be encouraged. But also the fact that he has this uncanny ability to elevate his game for these big events. He said it himself. He is motivated by majors. That's what he's interested in. Um, again, even though the atmosphere isn't going to be there, he has that focus, has that intensity. And I think he'll play well this week. Um, obviously, John Ram, who was very short-lived world number one, dropped off it there, of course, this week. You know, how will he do seeking his first major? Only three guys who have been world number one haven't won a major. It's Westwood, Luke Donald, and John Ram. Could he get off that small list this week? I don't think he will, but certainly talent-wise, he could certainly contend. You know, Rory, as I said, hasn't played very well of late. Will he find the spark? I think he will play better, but I don't think he's going to win this week. Um, but Bryson DeChambeau, obviously, you know, he was a man of the moment when he came out of lockdown. He obviously, his transformation, you know, his physique, his game, his approach, indeed, some of the controversy that's followed him around of late. He's got himself into some very bizarre situations of late, making tens and fighting with cameramen and roles officials and ants, indeed, and just generally embarrassing himself at times. But Bryson DeChambeau, he's box office. You love to hate him. Yeah, love him or you hate him. But you know what? Golf needs its characters. It needs to have heroes and villains. If everybody was just beige, it would be boring. But Bryson brings colour. Can he bring a major win to actually back up the talk and back up the record? His major record is actually extremely poor. He's never finished in the top 10. He's never contended. So can he change that this week? He certainly thinks so. He has the power. He has the game. Does he have necessarily the temperament? Will perhaps Harding Park be a little bit more challenging than he thinks? Will he be caught out as the week progresses by the rough, by the trees? We'll have to wait and see. Um, elsewhere, if I look at guys potentially as being outside contenders. I think we could see some international players do very well, not Americans, that is. I think Matthew Fitzpatrick, the guy who's trending in the right direction, has a very good all-round game. I think Shane Lowry has gone really under the radar of late, played well last week at the WGC. Again, as a guy who's obviously a major champion now, wants to back up that win last year. Again, I think much will depend on the, on the conditions at Harding Park too. Jason Day is playing well again. You know, He's quietly playing some very good golf, former winner of this event. So there's so many players, Carl's coming into this week that are in good form. Um, it's very hard to pick a winner. We'll come to that later on, obviously. But I think Harding Park, the weather will be fascinating there. You know, we're talking here on Tuesday, and they've had what you guys would call the marine layer off the Pacific, you know, blanketing the golf course, much like what we saw last year at Pebble Beach, where it's very foggy, very very dark, a little bit cool and damp. The atmosphere is heavy. The ball's not travelling very far. The ball's not rolling on the fairway. So the golf course is playing much longer than what it appears on the yardage book. As the week progresses, looking at the weather forecast, um, it's to be actually quite breezy in San Francisco over the next four days, or, or over the four championship days. You know, maybe 18 to 20 mile per hour gusts. So that will play a part in it too. So the golf course could firm up, particularly on the greens. They're quite narrow greens at Harding Park. Um, so I'm fascinated to see how this golf course will play. I think the conditions will play a part. Um, so I think one player to look out for actually you know, based on last year in California, one guy who's actually playing quietly quite well of late is Gary Woodland. I think he's one to look out, out for too. But I will mention quickly on Tiger. You know, Fred touched on obviously the lack of golf Tiger's played of late competitively. I do think that is a problem. Um, I, I just I find it very hard to see him coming in here and playing over four days more consistently than the likes of Thomas and Kepka and and DeChambeau and, and Xander Schofley and those kind of guys. I just don't really see it happening. But as always, as a caveat, it's Tiger Woods, he can do anything. And um, I think it would be a, a remarkable achievement if he could win the PGA this week. So wait and see. I mean, one, one way or another, you know, golf, major golf on TV, as Fred said, it's on prime time in the, in the Eastern Coast in the US. So golf at night to watch. Uh, this time, in this unique time, it's going to be great to have that. And actually, I have personally quite enjoyed the lack of fans at golf tournaments. Um, I haven't noticed that, you know, the lack of um, getting the hole and baba booey and mashed potato and all this stuff. I haven't mentioned it. Someone's obviously found the get in the hole man and locked him away and hasn't let him out yet. So assuming he doesn't get to Harding Park, going to enjoy that. But um, yeah, I think 
it, it'll be a, a major, a different feel to a major, Carlos. Um, but I think when it, it does kick off and we do get into that Sunday, there will still be an intensity, but a different kind of intensity with the players within the group themselves with no fans. And I think in a weird way, that will be actually compelling uh, in a different sense. I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out uh, on Sunday. Brent, it's time for picks. Tell us about who you think are the players to win to give us a dark horse and uh, whichever picks you wanna wanna give us now. Okay, I've I've got uh, I got some names here for you, um, and I'm gonna start out. This maybe surprise you a little bit, but for my ah. young guy, for my young guy, I'm gonna go with Colin Morikawa. I I love this guy, right? I I if he can win on Muirfield Village, even though it wasn't as tough as it was the next week. If he can win there, uh, he can win anywhere. I think this might be a, a perfect golf course for him. Uh, plus, isn't I think he's from California, right? So it might be kind of the perfect scenario for him. Not Nobody's really expecting a lot out of him, and, and he's obviously playing well. So I, I do like Justin Thomas. Uh, he's hitting on all cylinders. I think he's still – I think he still has that little bit of a chip on his shoulder – that I'm a little bit better than Jordan Spieth and Jordan gets all this recognition, but I'm really better than he is. And I, I think he's, I, I think he wants to keep progressing and being seen as the best player. So I like Justin Thomas, uh, Brooks Kepka. Um, I think he's just a little bit inconsistent yet. Yes. He's trending. Yes. He's getting better. Uh, will he win this week? I doubt it, but I do like him. Webb Simpson, you know, he won next door at Olympic, right? That's where he won his U.S. Open. So he likes this area. This should be a very good golf course for him. Um, I, I think he has a good attitude going in there. I think he thinks it's a good golf course for him. So, And he's had a great start uh, since the tour came back in June. He, he's been very, very good. So uh, one guy I just added because I didn't, we hadn't talked about him at all tonight is Ricky Fowler. Ricky's just been kind of lurking around there, uh, been a little bit up and down since they came back, but uh, he's been playing a little bit better of late, and he could be a guy that could do well on this course. You know, he's been, he changed his swing a little bit, and you could see last week that he was a little more comfortable with it. Things were coming a little easier for him, and he's got that good putter, so this might be a good place for him, and then he's another California guy. So guys that are just outside my top five were uh, Patrick Cantley, another California guy, and Victor Hovland, another young guy, but a guy that's been playing extremely well uh, in these tournaments since they started back up. And also, did I mention that I really like Colin Morikawa, guys? I, I really like him a lot. Um, I got some Euro players here. I, I don't want to forget about, uh, um, of course, Rory. You mentioned him, Kieran. Uh, he's always a threat. Uh, you're right. He, I just don't think he's been playing with any enthusiasm. You could, I look back at his finishes, and they're just crap. I mean, he could get that kind of finish just playing with his eyes closed, right? <laughs> um, so I think he needs to get a little excitement in his game, and this might be the place to do it. It's a major. He might get up for it. Mark Leishman, I think this is a great golf course for him. I think it's – Shane Lowry has been playing decent of late as well. This might, this might be a good week for him. He might want to try and win another, uh, another major. But then that leaves questions about, well, what about Bryson DeChambeau? Well, I don't think it's a good place for him. What about Sun J.M.? He's way up there in the FedEx Cup. I don't think this is right for him. What about Xander Shoffley? His game travels on, on hard golf courses. He might be a factor this week. Patrick Reed, I think he moves the ball too much right to left. I don't think that'll work here. But, but I, I have to say, V.J. Singh did really well at Harding Park a few years ago. And Reed's game is very similar, playing a big hook. Uh, Daniel Berger, he can win anywhere at any time if, if he gets that hot putter and keeps in the fairway a little bit. John Rahm, what can I say? Great player. You know, I don't think he'll win this week, but he, he might be pretty high up on the leaderboard. So those are the names that I came up with. You can also talk about Tony Finau, Gary Warder, and then I mentioned Patrick Cantley earlier. I don't think Finau would win, but uh, he's been playing really good this year. So my top five to go back, just Colin Morikawa, JT, Brooks Kepka, Webb Simpson, and Ricky Fowler. And then a bunch of other guys that I'm going to keep an eye on, guys. <laughs> you almost mentioned the whole field there. I mean, <laughs> that's that's about, I was about to say the same. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I like to touch all the bases. All right, all right. Hey, Karen, tell us about your picks. 
Well, I, you see, listening to Fred there, I really intended to pick different guys from Fred, but given that Fred mentioned most of the field, I think I'm <laughs> left with Rich Beam and Sean McKeel on my list here. So, oh, why Yang? You can have why Yang. He's not in the field actually this oh, week. Oh, well, you're gonna have him anyhow. <laughs> To be fair, he probably has as much chance of winning as the other guys do. But um, exactly. But uh, yeah, so I think Fred touched on a lot of likely contenders there. I do think Justin Thomas. I do. You mentioned that chip on the shoulder. I think he has. He just has that edge to him that I don't think a lot of the the players have these days. A lot of the top players certainly, you know, talent wise, are all fantastic. But what separates you know the, the the elite player? What separates the guys that win the majors that win regularly? What separates Justin Thomas from Tony Finau? I mean, both incredible golfers, both have all the tools, you know, but Thomas just has a little bit of a gritty side to him. As you say, he has that little chip in his shoulder that I think is very healthy for a guy at the highest level of his sport. So I think Justin Thomas will be in contention this week. Uh, obviously, winning back-to-back -back is a rare thing, but it can be done. Um, he has won this event before. So I think he will certainly be in the conversation going into the weekend one way or the other. So I, I would not be surprised if he wins this week. He's definitely in my top five. Likewise, Brooks Kepka, I think he has have to go on the record with the fact that you know, he plays so well in majors consistently, even when he's not playing well necessarily around them. Uh, he has that, again, so it's that chip on the shoulder, that little edge to his game and his personality that I think is very refreshing. Um, and he sometimes some people get a little bit, uh, they're not too sure how they feel about him because he isn't the warmest personality. He does say what he thinks, but you know, I'm all for that. So I, I quite like him and I think he's a superb player and he has got that edge to his game. And he has got obviously a supreme record and great confidence. So winning three in a row would be incredible. It would be historic. So therefore the, the law of averages would suggest that it's unlikely to happen because you know, if Jack and Tiger can't do it, how can Brooks do it? You know what? Just by saying that, that's what he's thinking. They, they didn't do it. Why can't I do it? So he wants to be the guy to do that and then make that historic leap and become that guy to win three in a row. So I think Kepka will play quite well this week. Whether he has enough over the four rounds to win, I'm not sure, but I think he will play very well and will certainly be in that top 10 going into the weekend. So elsewhere, I really do like Webb Simpson. I think his play is superb. Your Fred touched on the Olympic club there. Webb Simpson is now a better player than what he was when he won the US Open, um, I think almost certainly. I think he's now a better all-round golfer for the past two years, winning the Players' Championship. You know, great success on the PGA Tour this year as well. I think um, you know, while it's a, you know, every golf course really has a longer hitter's golf course as such, but I think Simpson has that you know, grittiness about him to get round the golf course in good fashion and score well. And again, he's someone who he wins big events. And so under pressure, he's a guy you can rely upon. So I think he will play quite well this week. In terms of more outside names, you know, I do like Matt Fitzpatrick. I think he's someone who, while he hasn't won in the US as of yet, I think he has a very good all-round game for tough golf courses. Um, so I can see him playing well this week. Uh, I also like, you know, I said earlier, Shane Lowry. I think Shane Lowry is someone who, talk about a chip in the shoulder, he does, I think, somewhat feel that he doesn't get the recognition he deserves from last year's achievement. Early on in the PGA Tour, since the return, he's, he's been put in some very strange groupings, not marquee groupings, not befitting a major champion, a reigning major champion indeed. I think he did notice that, but now he's in a marquee group playing with Kepka this week and Gary Woodland, who I also think will play well this week. So I think Shane Lowry has all the tools, all that creativity, great touch around the greens. There is thick rough around us. The putting surfaces here at Harding Park. I think that touch will help uh, Shane, you know, score well and potentially compete. Xander Schofley, you know, has a great all-round game, plays in tough golf courses very well, appears to be a major champion in the waiting. Uh, this could be his week. We'll have to wait and see. So that'd be my kind of top five players. I think Rory McIlroy is kind of the wild card this week where I think anything could happen with Rory. If Rory turns up and misses the cut, it wouldn't surprise me. If he comes up here and he you know, plays really well and is right there on Sunday, it wouldn't shock me either. You know, Fred touched on the intensity, the enthusiasm that Rory's perhaps lacked of late. Rory touched on this um, the other day in the press where he said that his major wins you know, all started with a great first round and getting out the gate really quickly. So I think if Rory goes out there on Thursday and he's in the top 
you know, three or four players, gets in the 60s potentially on Thursday and is in that position to to contend over the weekend. I think Rory will play quite well. If he has a mediocre start and kind of shoots, you know, over par, round par, doesn't quite finish in the top 20 after the first day, and I think he's kind of destined to have that middle of the field finish that's kind of been the norm of late. So, Carlos, I don't want to take all the guys from you, but for me, my top five, I think, would probably be Justin Thomas, Brooks Kepka, Webb Simpson, Shane Lowry, and I'm going to probably give the edge to Gary Woodland to complete my top five. All right, so it's time for the, the shocker for everybody here. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to start chalking the world here as the gambler that I am, right? Because I'm, I'm the, the, the resident uh, player and gambler here, right? So I'm going to give you my three dark horses. And I'm going to start with the first shocker. And that's going to be Abraham Answer. Yeah, he has not win, right? He has never won. But you know what? He's, be- he's at his best in the big events. If you remember, playing, he was the star of the international teams near Oxford last, week, last year uh, in December. And in addition to that, he has a T17, T4, T12, and T15 in his last four WGC starts, respectively. And twice he contended at the FedEx Cup play of events. He's at its best. He's fearless, plus he has the game to compete here in this type of, uh, of uh, course. Another shocker. Here we go. And it's an inter- another international. Tom Lewis. I mean, you, you might be saying, who, what? Mm, Tom Lewis, who is that? Well, you know, Memphis sure became acquainted with what the somewhat anonymous Englishman last weekend. Okay. He said at three over par after two rounds at WEC FedEx St. Jude, but he pulled a, a 61 on Saturday, which, you, by the way, a new, new course record since the event was assimilated into the WGC, seemingly out of nowhere, kept his foot on the gas on Sunday, guarding four birdies on four consecutive uh, front nine holes, searching to the late cold lead, finishing in a tie for second. You know, I know he has l- lacks the experience on the major stage, but I'm sure Kieran can agree with this, who has seen him there in the European tour, he has notched a number of tremendous finishes in big-time European Tour events, and this is a big-time tournament. Again, that's why we call him a dark horse. Now, another dark horse, and this is a veteran international as well, is Louis Usheisen. He was six last week. He got to the quarterfinals of the WGC World Match played here in 2015, so to me, he's another no-brainer. He's playing well. He feels good. His back is feeling good, so that's good enough for me to bring him as one of the dark horses. Now, players to win. Let's start with Patrick Cantley, okay? He looks to be on the verge of joining the ranks of major winners. Contending at last year's Masters and finishing T3 at the US Open, he ranked already in the top 10 for more than a year now. He will be arriving at TPC Harding Park in good form. He had that 65, 67 last week in Memphis. His Tito Green, may, green uh, his Tito Green game makes him a threat anywhere, and the moment has never looked too big for him. So he's ready for this. Kieran, I agree with you. Gary Woodland, uh, he he was runner up to Rory McIlroy, 2015 at the WGC World Match Play. He has missed just one cut over a year now. Has four top tens this season. Watch out for Gary Woodland. Matthew Fitzpatrick, I believe his game is absolutely ideal for this course. Fairways and greens all the way. He has back-to-back top 10 finishes. I think he has the best chance of any Englishman to win this week. I got to bring in Tiger Woods. I can't leave him out. I don't know why. I mean, he has huge success on this course. In the past, specifically the 2009 uh, President's Cup where he won all five of his points here at this event and you already mentioned about this, the 2005 WGC American Express Championship, where he defeated uh, John Daly in the playoffs. So he's coming on the event under the radar as much as possible for a Tiger Woods. Uh, everybody's concentrated on his back and everything like that. But I think he knows better than all of us. Uh, he wouldn't be playing here if he wouldn't be at a condition that he knows that he can win. Webb Simpson, uh, he has had two wins in his last seven starts. He's up to number four in the world rankings, 12 last week. Uh, he won his only major at the Olympic Club, which is pretty much next door to TPC Harding Park. Without a doubt, 
he's being overlooked sometimes, and he has been playing really well, really confident, and he knows if he wins, he goes to up to number one. My pick to win, Rory McIlroy. I, I feel he's coming under the this event. Everybody's talking about Brooks Kepka. Is they're talking about John Ram? They're talking about Tiger Woods. For the first time, he's really under the radar. So there's no pressure for him. And you mentioned Kieran that it's key for him to get a quick start. I think that will help him because now I, I know he hasn't been playing well since since the return from the lockdown, and uh, he will he will be uh, he's not happy maybe about where his game is at. But I believe that that pressure not being an, and that under that pressure at the beginning and not seeing all his fans uh, around is going to help him a lot. And I think Roy McIlroy will finally win his first major in six years. So Fred, I'm going to give you the closing thoughts first. Well, I know you guys are pretty, uh, pretty sad to hear this, but um, uh, John Daly announced today that uh, he's not going to travel to San Francisco for the, uh, for the PJ Championship, um, and he uh, took to Twitter and said, uh, "California now number one in cases and deaths. I had knee surgery. I'm diabetic and don't feel comfortable flying. Risk exposure with my health not worth it." Danny McCarthy's taking his place, so I know we're all sad that JD's not in the field this week. Um, no chance this week. Uh, I've got we. Nobody mentioned Phil, right? We didn't even mention Phil. I got no chance. Phil, Dustin Johnson because of his back, just Jason Day because of his health. Um, so, and also I put Tiger on this list, but I, you just can't ever hardly count him out. So um, we've got international players not there. Patty Harrington, J.B. Holmes, well, J.B. Holmes is not international, but uh, Charles Howell III, uh, V.J. Singh, Francesco Molinari, international player, Eddie Pepperell, Lee Westwood, Thomas Peters, your guy, Y.E. Yang, that I gave to you, uh, Kieran, and uh, Shugo Imahira, okay? So none of these guys had a chance to win anyhow, so it doesn't really matter. 97 the top, 100 are there. Um, yeah, I, it's going to be good. It's a major championship. Can't wait to see it, guys. Let's start. Let's tee it up right now. Kieran, final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a very unique major championship. Um, obviously, no fans, different kind of atmosphere, but when it's all said and done, it is a major, it's, it's one of only three opportunities this year for these guys to actually, you know, secure that place in history and become a major champion. Whether you're a guy going for your first or a guy trying to, you know, get, repeat previous glories. I mean, there's so many storylines, so many players that have been playing very well. I think the PGA Tour has actually been very compelling since it returned. Some fantastic winners, some great leaderboards, some great finishes. And I think it's really set us up for this particular week. Um, I, you know, obviously we've mentioned so many guys that could win. I think that just highlights the strength of this field, but also the, the form of so many of the players coming into it. I think that's the key thing. I mean, this is not the, – the, all these guys have played you know, quite intensely coming into this week. Obviously, since the shutdown, most of them have played at least five events since we, the game came back. So there's no guys that are really rusty, apart from perhaps Tiger, uh, but we know he, he can do anything. So I think it's going to be fascinating. I see. I think it will be a little bit different, obviously, in terms of how it feels. But I think you know, when it's all said and done, it is a major. And when you get onto Sunday afternoon on the back nine, it will feel that way and you will feel that intensity. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a really fascinating week, uh, one that could be unpredictable in many respects. Um, I'm intrigued to see which kind of player will succeed in this golf course. Um, but I'm also intrigued to see just, you know, can we see some of these younger guys to take advantage of this unique environment to potentially secure an unlikely major win. Uh, I think that will be a potential dynamic, that dynamic to it. But I do feel that the favourites here will all be in contention. I think it's one of those weeks where we're going to see the top guys you know, play to their best and then it's going to be a, a shootout between them. So, yeah, I think it's going to be fascinating. You, you mentioned Rory, you know, Carlos there, I think. If he was to win, I mean, that would be, you know, a huge deal. You know, him to get his fifth major victory, and that would put him level uh, with Seve Ballesteros on that list and just one behind Nick Faldo. So, you know, Rory is getting up there now with one of the, the, the top all-time European players. 
a major win's been a long time coming for him. And uh, if it was to happen this week when it was slightly unexpected, um, then it would be you know a huge deal. But I think there's going to be a, a really intriguing story one way or the other. Um, th- there will be history made. It might very well be three in a row for Brooks Kepka. It could be a new champion. Um, I'm looking forward to watching it. And actually, I'm glad that we're doing this chat so late at night because given this event is on the West Coast in the US, I'll be watching it at this time of night as well. So I'm glad like I'm training. getting used to it. Like training, training for you. Exactly. I'm pacing myself. I'm acclimatizing myself for the, the time difference. I'll be living in California time over the next five, six days. But uh, yeah, looking forward to it. And as always, I've enjoyed uh, looking ahead to the event with you guys. But uh, I say majors are that one little piece of history. We've been a, you know, a year without one. And uh, they are they are special. They are you know defining. It's what the sport is about. It's what guys are remembered for, and it's what fans recall for years to come. And uh, hopefully, they leave Harding Park with uh, some indelible memories. And uh, you know what? I, I think we will. I think we'll see something quite special uh, this weekend. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see how is it going to unfold. Finally, we got a major. Finally, after over a year to see it, and. Um, I, I just would imagine if Tiger Woods would be in that final group, I would encourage all the players, all the caddies, all the people there to just form that wall behind him too, so he feels like he's back with all those people there. But anyway, we'll see. It would be number 16, so it would be amazing. But hey, with that, we will close up our preview of what the PGA Championship, the 102nd edition will be this weekend. We all can't wait to it. Now we're going to go to our final putts. Kieran, you have uh, more COVID-19 cancellations, unfortunately, to talk about. So what happened there? Yes, obviously, that's been a, a defining story throughout this year. Events that have not been played have been cancelled or postponed for an indefinite period. And there were two other events added to that list. Um, not unexpectedly, it has to be said. So the uh, this year, the 2020 Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship, which would be the 20th edition of that event, which is played in St Andrews at Carnoustie and Kings Barnes, more or less the European Tour's equivalent of the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, played across three fantastic golf courses with celebrities, the amateurs, great appeal. It's a great celebration, a wonderful event, really. Actually, almost the, the, the events at its best away from the golf course, the parties, the big the street parades that they have, firework display, it's a real carnival atmosphere when the Dunhill is here. But obviously, unique times and the Dunhill Links made the decision not to stage the event this year. Uh, so it will be played next year uh, in 20, 2021. And uh, they said themselves and the, their committee said, this is a real disappointment for ourselves and for all golf lovers, especially those that appreciate Links golf. Alfred Dunhill has been supporting golf at the home of golf and in Scotland for 35 years initially with the Alfred Dunhill Cup and for the past 19 years with the Alfred Dunhill Links Championship. We commend the Scottish Government in their resolute response to the pandemic. We do not wish to undermine their efforts or cause any undue risk to the communities that normally host us. Given the international nature of the event and and in particular our large amateur field, we felt this was the most prudent decision to take. And Johan Rupert, who runs Dunhill and who oversees the event, his tournament, he said in an interview that um, it was his love for the community of St Andrews. He didn't want to put it at risk by bringing people from all over the world to this small town for that week, potentially bringing the virus back here. Uh, and fortunately, we've not had uh, too much of an impact of it uh, in this part of the country, gratefully. And he felt that it would be uh, irresponsible to potentially put that at risk. So I think it was the, the correct decision to make a shame. It's a shame to have it this year. It's an event I also look forward to every every year. Uh, we'll have to wait another year to have it back. But uh, hopefully, when it does come back next year, we can have a, a sense of normality again, and we're back to how things once were. And that's something we all hope to see the case. But also, Carlos, in the other other hemisphere, other part of the world entirely, uh, the Australian Open, one of the most historic events in golf, it will not be played in 2020. So they're hoping to play this event potentially in the early, early part of next year, which would be the, the summer in Australia. And that's still unknown as at the moment. So we're not too sure when the Australian Open will be held. It would normally be held in November. At the moment, there are multiple dates in the timeline up for consideration. Obviously, it will depend on obviously the, how the pandemic is being controlled in Australia at that time. 
Um, so again, it's still uncertainty there, but the Australian Open obviously is one of the truly great historic events in golf. And it's been a year that we've seen the Open Championship, obviously you know, postponed by a year, the first time since World War II, and the Australian Open has a, a, a you know almost an equally you know, lengthy time in the game. And uh, it's a shame, a shame to see two of the most historic events in golf not being held this year. Um, but again, as I say, that's the extraordinary times that we live in. And it should also make us grateful, Carlos, that we have the PGA this year. And hopefully we'll also have the Ryder Cup and then the Masters later in the year. But at the moment, we have one major at the moment, which is the PGA Championship. And, um, you know, it's where we're glad to have it. And uh, hopefully it provides a, a respite and a distraction from what is going on in the wider world. How crazy is that? That whenever you play the Masters next year, you can say that you literally win it back to back if you do it, right? Because it's going to be the last major this year. It's going to be the first one next year. So. That's crazy. Fred, tell us about the 3M ratings. Um, yeah, golf continues to do really well on TV. Uh, seems like, you know, with the lack of other sports, people got to watch in golf. And now even though baseball's back, basketball is back, people are still watching golf. And the 3M, which didn't have that great of a field, really, uh, it was up 14% over 2019's broadcast. So that's a sizable bump. Uh, for a little old 3M championship up in there in, in Minneapolis. And guys, uh, local golf courses and operators that I talk to around, uh, just around Northwest Ohio here, um, they're seeing full tee sheets, uh, the, like the golf course owners, they're not doing as many outings. A lot of outings are not being held. And so they're still filling their tee sheets, but they're getting full price uh, for, the, uh, for the green fees. So they're making more money. They're, they're happy about it. Uh, they don't have to give away the hot dogs or the steaks. The people are buying them and spending full full rate for them. Um, also, um, the, the, uh, one of the driving ranges here, uh, they're up 50% over last year. And I went over there um, one day last evening, almost every stall, and I think there must be, uh, I don't know, I never counted them, but there's got to be 25 or 30 stalls there to hit from. And they were all full. Everything was full. It was, it's absolutely amazing. Um, so, uh, guys, I want to mention real quick, uh, the August issue of Michigan Golf Journal comes out this week. It was released today, actually. Um, be sure and check out uh, Back Night Report TV on Roku and on YouTube. Um, this podcast will be there tomorrow, hopefully, and uh, be able to get there. We're also on TuneIn, iTunes, some other places. So uh, uh, check us out. Don't forget to join us next week. So Back Niners, that will wrap up another week of the Back Nine Report. Thank you for joining us. It's always our pleasure to bring you the latest on the world of golf. Special thanks to you, Kieran, for joining us again for the major. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. So thank you. Thank you. And I know it's been a long time, so you, you must be falling asleep. So please hold on. <laughs> 10, 10 more seconds. <laughs> Don't forget to see us again next week on YouTube or if you miss it, like Fred, uh, like Fred said, you can see, you can hear the audio version on iTunes TuneIn. If you haven't done so, hey, please follow the show. Our Twitter ID is at back nine report with the number nine in the middle. My name is Carlos Torres, along with Kieran Clark and Fred Alvader. We wish you to be happy, be blessed, and enjoy the great game of golf. Happy golfing, everybody. We want to see you on the back nine. Until next time.